can you guys guess which are the drugs that can cause pleural effusion using this mnemonic so in this mnemonic or a picmonic there's this lady we just we just had uh, eid yesterday no so eid mubarak to everybody there's this lady who is telling her son danish to go bring some methi so i can cook the night's meal and then the son being a good son is saying okay ami me and brother or bro will go bring it so there are five drugs which can cause pleural effusion based on the words which are highlighted or the letters or alphabets which are highlighted in red can you guys in the chat box guess or name the drugs which can cause pleural effusion we'll start in just a couple of minutes ensuring that everybody is getting the audio and video clearly any clues drugs which can cause pleural effusion good evening to all of you who have joined online thank you very much nawaz yes nitrofurantoin very good so the night night's meal night stands for nitrofurantoin nitrofurantoin does lead to pleural effusion it will be eosinophilic effusion ami ami stands for amiodarone very good amiodarone notorious so many side effects amiodarone including in the lung and in the pleura pleura pleural effusion in the lung it will lead to idiopathic pulmonary or rather it will lead to interstitial lung disease very good any others very good saurabh very very good dan stands for dantrolin methi okay methotrexate good attempt good attempt methotrexate is more towards causing uh, interstitial lung disease rather than pleural so it's methi not metho so something that the name contains methi bro is bromocriptin bromocriptin very good saurabh bromocriptin it's used in treatment of prolactinoma so or basically for as a dopamine agonist in prolactinomas it can be used in treatment of even parkinson's disease methi okay it's methimazole good attempt good attempt methimazole methimazole is a drug of choice for graves disease antithyroid drug tpo antagonist amiodarone very good bromocriptin absolutely correct dopamine agonist Okay, methotrexate. As as you guys were trying to say, methotrexate produces interstitial lung disease. So any patient with rheumatoid arthritis, no, when you're treating them with methotrexate and they develop interstitial lung disease, you're you're worried or you're confused whether it's the rheumatoid arthritis disease activity that produced the the interstitial lung disease or whether it's the methotrexate that you were treating them with that has produced the interstitial lung disease. The difference would be in rheumatoid arthritis generally the interstitial lung disease is of usual interstitial pneumonia type. You I UIP pattern whereas with methotrexate it is NSIP non specific interstitial pneumonia pattern so that difference helps but yes very good methi sir guide dr med prashant very good methi sir guide so you guys all of you got all the drugs right okay shashank <laughs> nice joke right so welcome to everybody i am grateful that you guys have taken time out and joined for this session where we try and discuss the important topics in the build up towards the ini may ini ct so uh, without wasting any further time i know uh, there are other better things live going on right now to watch than to be listening to me but i'm grateful that you guys have joined i don't want to waste any of your time so getting on with it so today's session is going to be yet another in the series of prepathons by manipal medes so this is for ini ct 2024 paper leak no i'm just joking no paper leak here okay we are only trying to build build your confidence and get you to perform better you've been joining us from 1st of april with starting with anatomy from uh, tejasvi sir and then the latest session yesterday was taken by nishan sir in surgery and it was a very good session so please continue joining us for these sessions where we try our best to try and prepare you for the upcoming ini exams okay so getting on with the discussion i start with cardiology we have a long way to go it's medicine so that's why it will take a long time for me 
I'll try and do it as early as I can. Okay, and, and try to keep it as relevant to your INA exams as possible also and we'll try to keep it interesting also. Okay, uh, discussions and uh, inputs from your side are always welcome. Right, so starting off with cardiology, uh, you guys know that ECG related questions are a favorite. So anyone who sets the INA paper, they're really, uh, they're one of, one of the few chapters which they really prefer taking questions out of is ECG. So ECG based questions are something that you need to expect apart from other clinical cardiology questions also. So mitral stenosis based and murmur based questions are very frequently asked in INI. So these are some things if you're preparing for INI, which is next month, you need to be aware of ECG and clinical cardiology based questions. Apart from that, heart failure and acute coronary syndrome based questions are also frequently asked. Last couple of years, they've been asking about NSTEMI, okay, heart failure, the drugs related and hypertension based questions. Okay, these are just some of the topics which based on the question papers, the last few question papers, number of uh, uh, topics from which questions have been frequently asked, which I've highlighted here. So we'll start off with ECG. So I hope uh, you guys have got an exposure to ECG during your undergraduate days, or you've been able to go to the ward and see and learn a little bit about the ECGs, but you will be tested based on this. So as recently as November, uh, this was November, I'm sorry, November INI, where there was a question, okay, based on ECG and they had given this kind of an ECG. So reading the scenario, we'll start away, start off by reading the scenario. It's a 14 year old boy was brought to the emergency room at 5 a.m. in the morning after his father noticed that he was, uh, he had developed an agonal breathing in sleep. So based on this clinical history, as well as the ECG finding, what do you think would be the diagnosis? What you can notice straight away is in the precordial leads, that's the V1, V2 and V3. You can notice that there is almost like an RSR dash pattern, right? So it looks like a right bundle branch block, but it's not. It's not exactly a right bundle branch block. What is it? There is a coving, okay? So coving of ST, coving ST elevation. So whenever there's an ST elevation, you're worried whether it could be a myocardial infarction. But this kind of convex convexity upwards, this kind of a convexity upwards is almost hyper convex, right? So when we expect in myocardial infarction, there is going to be, okay, Meenakshi is asking if I'm bringing Ram and Sham. okay. So when there is an MI, then when there is a myocardial infarction, you do expect a convexity upwards type of ST elevation and that really helps you to distinguish this kind of ST elevation from pericarditis ST elevation. So in pericarditis ST elevation, you expect it to be a concavity upwards, right? And there'll be a little bit of PR depression also. So PR depression along with the concavity upward ST elevation points more towards pericarditis, right? Whereas in ST elevation MI, STEMI, you expect there is an ST elevation with a convexity upwards, but not so convex also. This is quite hyper convex. Okay, so it's not an RBBB, certainly not because the ST is definitely elevated. In a right bundle branch block also, you may get this kind of an R, S, R dash pattern, but this is not. This is instead ST elevation with coving upward pattern. And this is what you see in Brugada syndrome. Very good. Many of you have got it right. It is Brugada syndrome. So among the options, Brugada syndrome would be the right choice. And this is aided by the clinical history. So it was a young boy who's developed agonal breathing in sleep. So whenever such events happen during sleep, so a patient ends up collapsing during sleep or during fever episodes. So fever and sleep would be important history for Brugada syndrome because these can end up triggering malignant arrhythmias. And that is why the patient or the boy ended up developing agonal breathing. Okay, so likewise, if the scenario was different, if they had instead said that the person was an athlete, an athlete collapsed while doing intense training, heavy intensity training, and instead of an ECG, they ended up showing uh, an image of the heart. Maybe in on, on an echo, maybe it showed, on an echo, it showed something called systolic anterior motion. Maybe they point out, maybe they label the echo uh, image or photograph with systolic anterior motion or ACIP asymmetric septal hypertrophy what would the diagnosis be then that is yet another examiner's favorite in INI and not just INI even in NEET that is HCM very good HCM or HOCM very frequently asked question and in that instead of an ECG no typical ECG findings but you will develop uh, you will rather expect that it will be an athlete a young person who was trying to work out and during high, heavy intensity training they ended up developing this kind of uh, malignant arrhythmia okay so the most common cause of death in HOCM is a malignant arrhythmia and that has been also asked as a PYQ in, in INI. Okay, so remember 
the important points regarding HOCM, HOCM is of course like Brugada syndrome, both are autosomal dominant inherited. Okay, whereas in Brugada, the problem lies with SCN, sodium channel SCN 5A, correct? SCN 5A mutation for Brugada syndrome, whereas for HOCM, the more common genes are myosin heavy chain. So, MYH7 and MYBPC3. So, but both are autosomal dominant inheritance. You may get a family history even in the scenario where there has been a sudden cardiac death in a family member. Along with that, ECG changes very important for Brugada, whereas for in, in the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it will rather be echo or maybe they have even shown an autopsy figure of or autopsy image of HCM heart. So, they could even pose that as the clue. Okay. One final ECG change. So, if a patient ends up collapsing and they are brought and luckily they, they have spontaneously been resuscitated and then you see in the ECG, there is a going upward pattern like this, then you definitely in the precordial lead, you think of Brugada syndrome. If instead it was an athlete who collapsed and the ECG ended up showing something like this, okay, something like an RSR dash, but not quite like this, okay, and this is something known as epsilon wave. So, where do you get epsilon wave? So, they gave you a scenario where the patient is collapsed and they've shown you the ECG. In that ECG, after an R and an S wave, the positive and the negative deflection in the precordial leads only, it will be in the precordial leads there will be a small positive deflection like this following the following the QRS complex and that is called an epsilon wave. Epsilon wave, so epsilon wave is seen in anybody? It is seen in arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Very good. Very good, sort of arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So similarly, it is actually, it actually happens quite frequently where athletes collapse they sometimes successfully resuscitated, sometimes unfortunately not. So, but when the they undergo testing, they it ends up being revealed on an MRI or perhaps on an autopsy that they had arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So, remember, epsilon wave is for arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. What about delta waves? Where do you get delta waves? Everybody knows this. So, delta waves. I'm sorry. Yeah, delta waves are seen in. So other important points include bundle of Kent, I will wait for the answer, bundle of Kent, delta waves, PR being short, okay, and the bundle of Kent is generally left lateral, very good, WPW, okay, so WPW, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, this is yet another example of a cause that can end up producing cardiac arrest or malignant arrhythmia like a ventricular arrhythmia, ventricular fibrillation, where the patient may end up developing sudden collapse. Okay, So, all these are possible scenarios which can be mentioned, which can end up producing malignant arrhythmias on a collapse. So, keep these in mind, keep the scenarios in mind, keep the ECG changes in mind. This is how you may be tested. Okay, So, Brugada, WPW and epsilon wave of arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia and H HOCM of course. Okay, So, this just highlights that you need to be able to recognize ECGs also. Sometimes, if they give the scenario, it will help, but if they have given only an ECG, should be in a position to be able to diagnose because they will give you questions based on ECG and related topics. Okay, So, what I want you to do is any ECG that is given to you, if you are if you are thinking it is an arrhythmia, if it is a rhythm related disorder, first look at the rate. Okay, Is there tachycardia or not? If there is tachycardia, then you can proceed differently. Uh, how do you find out how the, what the rate is? So, you guys should know the rate calculation on an ECG is you divide 300 divided by number of large squares between successive RRs okay, for a regular rhythm. So, when the rhythm is regular between two QRS complexes, count the number of large boxes and that will give you the rate. I okay. will show you here as an example. So, if these are the two successive QRS complexes, I will end up counting the number of large boxes. Okay, The large boxes 1, 2, 3 and 4, maybe 4 and a half. Right? So, if I divide 300 divided by 4.5, it will come somewhere around, it will basically come between 60 and 75. So, because 300 divided by 5 would have been 60 and 300 divided by 4 is 75. So, between that, right? So, that is how you will calculate the rate. So, if you have seen an ECG and it shows tachycardia because you divided 300 by number of large squares between successive RRs, suppose you got only 2, you got for example, only 2 
large boxes between successive RRs and when you divide, you'll get the rate as 150. So definitely the patient has tachycardia, right? So this is how you determine the rate. Find out if there's tachycardia or not. If there is tachycardia, next proceed to determining what, how the QRS is. Is the QRS normal? That means is it narrow or is it wide? So you decide that based on the width of the QRS. If it is exceeding three small squares, if the width of the QRS is exceeding three small squares, then it becomes wide QRS. If it is narrow, it should be less than three small squares. Okay. Next, look at the rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? And finally, look at P waves. Okay. Is the P wave present or absent? If it's absent, it gives you different, different diagnosis. If P waves are present, but there are multiple, multiple morphologies, three or more different morphology of P waves, it gives you a different diagnosis. And let, look at the P and QRS ratio. Are they equal? For every QRS, is there a P? Is there a single P? Or is there, are there too many P's? There are multiple P's for each QRS. Okay, I'll tell you the significance of all these shortly. So, for example, if the patient has a tachycardia, so you look at the EC, you are given an ECG, you looked at the ECG, you ca calculated the rate. So you need to be a little fast in this. You need to practice a little bit so that you can save time in your exams. Okay, so try and practice on ECGs. Look at, cal uh, try and calculate the rate on in different ECGs. Okay, so 300 divided by number of large boxes. So it may be 300 divided by 3, 300 divided by 2. Sometimes it may be even 300 divided by 1. Right, so if the rate is very high, so you need to be well versed in calculating. So once you get tachycardia, look at the complex. If it's a tachycardia and the complex is wide, QRS complex, I mean, okay. So QRS complex being wide with tachycardia, wide complex tachycardia at your level, even at INI level, always VT, VT, okay. So VT is wide complex tachycardia. Then you proceed to what the question is asking. Is it only asking to diagnose? Is it asking for treatment? Is it asking for cause and so on? Okay, so. If suppose the patient has tachycardia, there is tachycardia and it's narrow complex and a narrow complex tachycardia. Next, you look at the rhythm. Is it irregular? So irregular narrow complex tachycardia narrows down the differentials. Very good, Dr. Med, ventricular tachycardia. So it narrows down the differential diagnosis to either atrial fibrillation or one more. So what is the differential for narrow complex, narrow QRS complex, irregular tachycardia? What is the other differential apart from atrial fibrillation? So you may be I'll give you clues. The scenario will be telling that the patient is a patient of COPD and the patient has taken perhaps theophylline group of drugs. So which arrhythmia would this be? Irregular narrow complex tachycardia. Matt, very good. Multifocal atrial tachycardia. So multifocal atrial tachycardia is a differential diagnosis for atrial fibrillation. The difference would be P wave. So that's why next you go and look at the P wave. If the P wave is absent, obviously the diagnosis becomes atrial fibrillation. If the P wave is present and there are multiple morphologies of P waves, then it becomes multifo multifocal atrial tachycardia. Okay. In case the rhythm turned out to be regular, then again proceed and look at P waves. If the P wave absent, regular narrow complex tachycardia is PSVT. Okay. For your exams, it is PSVT. PSVT is narrow complex regular tachycardia. Okay. The other differential for that would be atrial flutter. So in atrial flutter, you would end up getting multiple P waves for each QRS. Okay. So multiple P waves for each QRS. I'll show you these now. I'll show you these. Okay. Let's proceed. Right. So what about this ECG? You guys can see it. I hope, right. You can see them. You can make out the QRS complexes and uh, just visually looking at it straight away. You can almost tell that th there is tachycardia, right? Even if you had to calculate, definitely sawtooth. Okay, yes, sawtooth appearance. Very good. So definitely tachycardia. I, I hope you guys agree. So in case we had to know, uh, follow the same approach which we, which we discussed. So if the rate definitely is showing tachycardia in this ECG. Next, you look at the QRS. QRS, is it wide or narrow? Definitely it's wide, no, because it's lasting for more than three. It's well beyond three actually. So, but more than three small squares, if the duration of QRS is more than three small squares, definitely it becomes a wide complex tachycardia. And then look at the rhythm. Okay, it's it's regular, right? There's hardly any irregularity. It's just too fast though, quite fast. So no question of irregularity. It's it's definitely regular. And you don't need this aspect, but anyway, looking at it, trying to look at it, is there P wave or not? Okay, so you can hardly make out any P wave. So this is not so important anymore because just with the first two points itself, you are sure if a patient in INI, if they give you an ECG and it is wide complex and tachycardia, think of ventricular tachycardia. Okay, so there itself you get the diagnosis and then you try and 
decipher what they are trying to ask. Are they asking how do you treat such a patient? See, the problem is when the ventricles are contracting on their own like this, they're not they're not waiting for the sinus impulse to come down. They're just autonomously contracting. So because of that, they'll not be filled with blood before they contract. So they may not end up producing enough stroke volume. So such patients very often end up becoming hemodynamically unstable. So such patients, when they have a ventricular tachycardia, they need to be given DC shock. Okay, so DC shock would be the treatment for any hemodynamic or instable or instability in a patient with ventricular tachycardia. If the patient has normal hemodynamics, if the patient does not have shock or does not have a hemodynamic instability, in that case, you can go for medical therapies. Amiodarone would be your drug of choice. The other drugs like procanamide can also be used. Very importantly, in myocardial infarction, so if MI ends up producing ventricular tachycardia, which is one of its electrical complications, right? So MI has a number of complications. There is hemodynamic, there is mechanical, and there is electrical. So electrical complications of myocardial infarction, one of them is VT. So a patient with MI ends up producing or uh, developing VT, the drug of choice in previous years used to be lignocaine, but that's not, that's no longer true. Okay. So the drug of choice for an MI related ventricular tachycardia is still amiodarone. Okay. So amiodarone, please choose amiodarone, not lignocaine. Please be clear on that. Okay. Otherwise, if the patient is, that this is only if the patient is hemodynamically stable. Any ventricular tachycardia with hemodynamic instability, first thing you have to do is give a DC shock. Okay. So you give DC shocks to all arrhythmias which have a re-entry. So re-entrant tachycardia or re-entrant based tachycardias, tachyrhythmias with hemodynamic instability, you can give DC shock because it will be effective. If it is not because of re-entry, so briefly I'll just mention arrhythmias could be either because of re-entry, re-entry mechanism, or it could be because of enhanced automatic automaticity or it could be because of delayed or rather after depolarization, delayed after depolarization or early after depolarization, after depolarization basically. So in case it is because of re-entry, then you can break the circuit. When you pass a shock, when you give a DC shock, all electrical activity within the heart is going to cease. Okay. So the first tissue to recover would be the sinus. That's what you expect. When the entire heart is electrically inactive, the first tissue should be the pacemaker. The SA node should take charge and the sinus rhythm should get established. That's the principle of giving a DC shock. But otherwise, if in case the patient is having a non reentry based arrhythmia, it will not be effective. If you would not be able to successfully, it, the chances are lesser. Okay. But of course you have to try. You can't be trying to make a diagnosis of the basis of the ventricular tachycardia. Maybe the ventricular tachycardia is because of enhanced automatic automaticity, or maybe because of early after depolarization, like in patients with, it's called torsidus depo, right? So patients with long QT, they can end up developing a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. But nonetheless, if the patient is hemodynamic hemodynamically unstable, you need to give them a DC shock. It may not work, but still you need to try, right? So re-entry based arrhythmias, re-entry can be micro circuit, micro re-entry or macro, okay? Micro re-entry include atrial fibrillation, AVNRT, okay? And macro include AVRT, I hope you guys know a little bit about this because uh, I know this is all a lot to be expecting for you guys to be knowing but a little bit if you guys know maybe this can be a sensitization session where you can go and read up a little more in detail okay for want of time I'm I will try to discuss as much as possible but if you have doubts you please ask me yes okay so the so drug for Digoxin induced VT. Okay, so digoxin induced VT would again you would you would have to rely on if the patient is hemodynamically unstable you would still have to rely on uh, electrical card uh, ele DC shock basically electrical cardioversion. But uh, if if you can then you can give DG bind. Okay, so that's one of the previous questions previous years questions where DG bind FAB fragment was asked. Okay, but otherwise hemodynamically unstable always go for a uh, a DC shock. Okay, so macro re-entry ventricular tachycardia would be another differential. Atrial flutter is again again another type of atrial flutter is again another type of macro re-entry arrhythmia. Okay, so all these would respond better for DC shocks. The others may not as much. Okay, so got it. Wide complex tachycardia. Always think of ventricular tachycardia. Okay, what about this one? What do you think? What is how's the rate? Is the rate fine? Okay, don't be confused by this segment of the ECG. Look at only those beyond it. Okay, these and these. So, do you think the QRS is fine? It's 
it's narrow these are less than three small squares no right so these are wide complex again so wide complex and there is tachycardia done don't think of anything else for your ini this is a ventricular tachycardia okay wide complex tachycardia ventricular tachycardia don't go beyond it okay there will be av dissociation you may be able to make out the p wave or or not or you you may end up finding that there is a an irregularity like in this case it's not entirely regular so slightly irregular but that doesn't matter it's a vt it's a wide complex tachycardia it's a vt but there is something different about it right not all qrs complexes resemble each other so although they are wide and there is tachycardia not all qrs complexes in terms of amplitudes as well as durations they don't resemble each other right so there are polymorphic ventricular tachycardia so polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is also known as it's twisting around the central axis no so a rhythm that twists around the central axis would be sorry okay a rhythm that twists around the central axis would be in the french so this was a previous year's question okay so this was asked last year last year in november so this was oh, i'm sorry in may so the previous year's question they, they kept an ecg like this where there were polymorphic qrs combined qrs complexes that seem to be different in terms of duration and length and the rate was high so this was a polymorphic vt that's also known as tosadis depo okay the french pronunciation tosadis depo tosadis depo occurs generally after qt is prolonged so can you name some drugs that prolong qt interval name some drugs that prolong qt interval so i i could have mentioned this earlier also so a patient who has collapsed after taking certain drugs you would have to think of pay perhaps the the reason underlying reason having been a tosadis depo that was triggered by prolonged qt right so it's called early after depolarization so what happens is depolarization is represented by the t wave right so if we had a qrs and then we have a t wave and that's the depolarization vector and then you are you are supposed to have a nisoelectric segment then followed by a p wave so instead if there was an early trigger and that ended up producing a qrs that landed on the previous t that's called r on t phenomenon so r on t phenomenon okay this is a little extra you guys may not need this but then just remember that when the when the qt is prolonged the the subsequent qrs may get triggered early and that might end up falling on the the previous t wave and that is called r on t phenomenon which can trigger very good very good a number of examples quinidine itraconazole macrolide antibiotics very good so if a patient is being treated for h pylori infection and they they've been given a course of 2 weeks of oac right so omeprazole amoxicillin and clarithromycin and the patient ends up collapsing after 10 days of treatment you need to keep in mind it might have been the macrolide the clarithromycin that triggered the qt prolongation okay so generally no funnily qt qt is calculated from the beginning of q to the end of t okay normally for men it is the upper limit is 440 milliseconds for women it is 460 milliseconds so there's a difference but uh, what you should remember is what, what are the drugs that prolong qt and qt funnily is prolonged by drugs which begin with q okay so like quinidine we should not very correct quinidine quinolones and quetiapine so these are some drugs that can prolong qt so please take a history of this any patient you encounter who has ended up developing this so right this would apply very similar to the previous example the rate is high the qrs is wide wide complex tachycardia settles it okay but funnily you know this rhythm when you see this rhythm this has been asked in three different forms in cardiology you, you can see this kind of a pattern in three areas one related to an arrhythmia one related to the respiratory pattern and one related to a murmur so can you guys guess all three are pyqs all three have been asked in ini uh, one has been asked in uh, neat rather so two in ini one in neat so can you guess if it's an arrhythmia that looks like this it's twisting around the base that's quite easy you, you guys already guessed it it's tosadis depo what about a respiratory pattern which resembles like this or which is depicted like this so there is gradually increasing depth of respiration then followed by peaking that means hyperopnea and then progressively it reduces and it comes back down to apnea so alternate cycles of apnea and hyperopnea these are known as very good very good vishwanath it's kusmals rather it's not kusmals it's saurabh was answered very good saurabh was answered it's shine strokes very good shine strokes breathing 
Shine Stokes breathing, this is how it was depicted, okay? This image was given and the question was identify the pattern of breathing. So, Shine Stokes respiration. Shine Stokes respiration in cardiology, so the cause is heart failure. Heart failure can produce Shine Stokes respiration. It's a, it's a type of central apnea or rather central hypoventilation. Okay, very good. The murmur, murmur has been identified by Dharani. Very good. That is aortic stenosis. So, crescendo, decrescendo intensity of murmur. So, you would have to end up placing S1 here and S2 here. Okay, so then it will end up making aortic stenosis. Very good. So, you guys have, are doing an excellent job. So, shine Stokes breathing. Okay, so remember this pattern when you see on an ECG, twisting around the uh, central base or uh, central baseline, that is tosidis depo. White complex tachycardia, always think of ventricular tachycardia. Okay, what about this ECG? So, following our method, is there tachycardia or not? Quite clearly there is, no? So, there is tachycardia. You can't see, if you can't see at least three small squares, uh, three large squares rather, if you can't see at least three large squares between successive QRS complexes, it is tachycardia. Okay, that much you can remember. Okay, so definitely not able to see three large squares between successive QRS complexes, definitely tachycardia. What about the complexes themselves? The QRS complexes, they're not more than three, right? They're not more than, they're not exceeding three small squares. So, this becomes a narrow complex tachycardia. So, if it's a narrow complex tachycardia, next look at, is the rhythm regular or not? So, looking at it, do you feel the RR intervals are fixed? The RR intervals, do they are they similar to each other or is there a variation? Definitely, there's a variation. So, that means it's an irregular rhythm. So, a narrow complex tachycardia with irregular rhythm comes down to two differentials, either atrial fibrillation or multifocal atrial tachycardia. So, in this case, next you need to look at the P wave. If you are seeing three or more morphology P waves, different P waves, then it becomes multifocal atrial tachycardia. But if there is no P wave which is discernible, then it becomes atrial fibrillation. So, can you guys make out where the P wave is in this ECG? Not quite, right? You can see certain deflections, but these don't represent, these, these are more like artifacts, okay? So, these these are actually devoid of P waves. So, absent P waves. So, absent P waves with narrow complex tachycardia, okay? Rate is increased, tachycardia, narrow, rhythm is irregular and P wave is absent. The diagnosis becomes atrial fibrillation. Very good. Very good. Nice. Okay, so... You guys got it. So, what will the situation be? Atrial fibrillation. So, it might be a patient with rheumatic valvular heart disease, mitral stenosis or the question may be about anticoagulation. So, please remember Chadwas, please read up Chadwas scoring. Okay. So, this is again yet another PYQ and other than that, of course, even if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, this becomes a micro reentrant type of tachycardia hemodynamically unstable, you need to give them cardioversion, DC shock, okay, DC shock. If they are stable, then again, you can decide, you need to anticoagulate them for at least three weeks before cardioversion, rhythm conversion, and then four weeks after the rhythm conversion. And then you can decide on the kind of antiarrhythmics you are giving. If the patient has hemodynamically stable and structural, no structural heart disease, there's atrial fibrillation without structural heart disease, AFib without structural heart disease, then you can go for then you can go for drugs like vernaclant, okay? Whereas, if the patient has structural heart disease with structural heart disease, then you can go for drug of choice would be amiodarone, okay? So, these are the options you can choose for atrial fibrillation, okay? Clinically, what would you see? The A wave would become absent in... So, in atrial fibrillation, there's absent P waves on ECG and absent A waves on JVP, okay? This much you should remember. Again, since the atrium is not not contracting, it's just fibrillating. So, fibrillating atrium, you can't develop A waves in the JVP. You can't develop S4 also. So, no S4. The fourth heart sound, remember, is produced because of atrial contraction against a non-compliant left ventricle. Left atrial contraction due to uh, atrial fibrillation. I'm sorry, the right atrial contraction. So, if, if there is an S4, uh, it, the contraction of the atrium should produce comp uh, turbulence against a non-compliant ventricle. If that's not happening, then there no, there will not be any S4 because the atrium is just fibrillating. It's not contracting in unison. Okay. So, these are the questions you can expect for atrial fibrillation, right? So, what about this ECG? In this ECG, very good, Dr. Med, DC shock 200 joules. So, this ECG, looking at it, there is tachycardia, yes. Definitely, the rate seems to be lesser than 
or rather it's it's greater than 100 the number of large squares seen between qrs complexes is less than 3 so definitely there is tachycardia is the complex wide or narrow it's narrow correct so narrow complex tachycardia no doubt how is the rhythm regular or irregular it is yet again irregular so you don't see that the rr intervals are constant there are some which are wider some which are narrow so this kind of variable rhythm that means irregular rhythm with narrow complex tachycardia next you look at the p wave uh, are you able to make out p waves not clearly okay not able to clearly make out p waves which again ends up making it atrial fibrillation right so if the patient has a narrow complex tachycardia with irregular rhythm and the p wave is absent it again becomes atrial fibrillation so this is yet another example of atrial fibrillation irregularly irregular rhythm with absent p waves narrow complex tachycardia okay so we've discussed about treatment antiarrhythmics anticoagulation anticoagulation of course you can go for no novel, novel oral anticoagulation uh, anticoagulants but there are two situations in which only vitamin k antagonists are used so which are those two situations vitamin k antagonists are used or compulsory rather you can't use no novel oral anticoagulants vitamin k antagonists are used for two situations which are Verapamil, very good. You can use verapamil for atrial fibrillation in a hemodynamically stable patient. You can use even beta blockers. But these are more rate control drugs. So remember atrial fibrillation, there is rhythm conversion, there is rate control and there is anticoagulation. So three aspects that you need to try and cover. So verapamil would act as a ra rate control drug. Very good. So Saurabh Sina says prosthetic valves, very, very good. So if it is a metallic valve so if it's a me metallic prosthetic valve and a moderate to severe ms yes very good moderate to severe rheumatic mitral stenosis is an indication for only vitamin k antagonists don't give no novel oral anticoagulants very good right so atrial fibrillation okay causes of atrial fibrillation several can be cardiac can be non cardiac so cardiac causes you all know ischemic heart disease mitral stenosis atrial septal defect even wpw syndrome wpw syndrome itself can trigger atrial fibrillation but non cardiac causes include thyrotoxicosis and something called holiday heart syndrome so you guys all know what is holiday heart syndrome if you know please comment right so what about this ecg moving on to this next ecg where you see again the rate definitely not three large squares between successive rrs that makes it tachycardia qr is definitely not white so that makes it narrow complex is the rhythm regular or irregular it is definitely regular it's not irregular Right, so the RRs are not varying much. Are, are P waves present? P waves are present. Okay, so P waves are present. That makes it sinus tachycardia. Okay, so this makes it a, an example of sinus tachycardia. Would that be correct? Almost. Very good. Shana was replying alcohol binge causing atrial fibrillation. Very good. That's called holiday heart syndrome. Very good. Himanshu also. Okay. Though it seems this ECG seems like it's regular, it's not. Okay. So if you observe closely, the RR intervals are slightly varying. If you look at this one and the next one, the RRs are varying. Okay. So actually it ends up becoming a irregular rhythm. So there is QRS that is narrow, there is tachycardia, but then there is an irregular ir irregularity to it. So after that, you look for the P wave. Okay, so you look for the P wave, you are finding P waves in the first few complexes and then it goes missing. Right, so here it's gone missing, here it's gone missing. Again, you're not able to find the P waves for quite some time, then you find a P wave. But this P wave does not resemble this P wave. So you're seeing different types of P waves, right? You're seeing two P waves which don't resemble each other. You're seeing sinus, these are sinus only, or rather these are narrow complexes. So these are narrow complexes which have followed successive narrow complexes which have followed sinus rhythm seeming sinus rhythms okay so there was p wave here there's no p wave here yet the complex has remained narrow so that means the impulse must be coming from the atrium only so when there is three or more morphologies even though it's missing you can count it as there must be a p wave that has triggered this qrs here so that means three or more morphologies of p waves you will expect that this is multifocal atrial tachycardia okay so rate is increased qrs is narrow rhythm is irregular okay and p wave is present but three or more morphologies so this makes it multifocal atrial tachycardia in history 
they will give you clues like COPD, patient has COPD and patient may have taken theophylline group of drugs which are arrhythmogenic. So, remember multifocal atrial tachycardia very rarely presents with hemodynamic instability. You don't expect that the patient with MAT would have a very high rate. It's very unlikely for them to have a very high heart rate and therefore hemodynamic instability is not very common. So, the question of trying to give them DC shock is out of out of picture. Okay. Very good. More common in COPD patients. Very good, Sharon. Correct. So, irregularly irregular rhythm, P wave is present with three or more morphologies makes it MAT. If P wave is absent, it makes it atrial fibrillation. Right. So, what about disc ECG? There is tachycardia. I hope you guys agree. Tachycardia definitely. Less than three large squares between successive QRS complexes. Next, look at the QRS complexes themselves. Do they appear wide or narrow? They appear narrow. Next, look at regularity. Do they appear regular or irre irregular? For the large part, they look regular only. The rate is quite high though. Okay, whenever the rate is very high, you know, even if it's an atrial fibrillation, it almost appears regular when the rate is very high. So, it's sometimes a little difficult. Practically, I'm saying. Otherwise, in this ECG, you have to take it as a regular rhythm. So, tachycardia, narrow complex, regular rhythm. Look at the P wave. Can you see the P waves? Where exactly are the P waves? Not really. Okay, so no P waves that can be made out, which means if the rate is high, if the QRS is narrow and the rhythm is regular and P wave is absent, that makes it automatically PSVT. Okay, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Narrow complex tachycardia with absent P waves, think of it as PSVT. Okay, so the question generally will involve adenosine. Okay, it will also involve adenosine in treatment of atrial fibrillation. So, do you give atrial in atrial fibrillation, do you give adenosine? No, no role. But in PSVT, definitely you give. Obviously, the first choice is carotid sinus massage. So, if a patient has atrial or rather uh, PSVT, the first act, act that you need to do is try and give them a carotid sinus massage and that itself may revert the PSVT. So, you are increasing the AV nodal refractoriness. That's what you do. When you give adenosine also, that's what it does. It transiently increases the AV nodal refractoriness. Therefore, it reduces the passage of the supraventricular rhythm into the ventricles. And then, the re since the re-entry circuit is broken down, the AVNRT re-entry circuit is broken down, the rhythm reverts to sinus rhythm. Okay. So, adenosine question is very common either in atrial fibrillation where it's not supposed to be used or in PSVT treatment where definitely it is to be used. Okay. You give them a flush of saline, you give them as close to the heart as possible. So, if there's a central line, please give it through that. If not, if you're giving it in the periphery, you give it and immediately give a flush of saline. That's because adenosine acts for only how long? How long does adenosine act? So, name a cardiology drug that acts for 6 seconds. Name the drug, cardiology drug that acts for 6 hours and the cardiology drug that acts for 6 days. Very good. Dharani is absolutely correct. Dr. Med, absolutely correct. Asthma, asthma, yes. Asthma also may be associated with MAT, but classically it's COPD. Vagal maneuver. Very good, Dr. Vishwanath. So, the drug that acts for only 6 seconds, obviously you guys know it's AMIO. Very good, Saurabh. Amidaron. But what about cardiovascular drug that acts for 6 hours? That's why the name is kept as LA6. Okay. Name itself is kept, the brand name I'm saying. The brand name is LA6 because the action lasts for 6 hours. And yet another drug which acts roughly for the duration of the platelet's lifespan. So platelet's lifespan is 6 to 7 days, no? So, cardiovascular drug, you guys know it, I think you will be answering. Very good. Digoxin. Okay, digoxin also, why not? Digoxin also has a very long half-life, even longer actually. It's, it's a very long half-life. Yes, very good. Lasix. Lasix is furosemide. Okay, remember, treatment of acute heart failure. When a patient has pulmonary edema, the mnemonic is LMNOP, I'm sorry, LMNOP, right? So, L is loop diuretic, but sometimes we say Lasix. Okay, loop diuretic, that is furosemide. M is morphine, N is nitrates, O is oxygen and P is position, right? So, do keep in mind, Lasix is a brand name. It's a loop diuretic that's furosemide, right? Okay, the advantage of furosemide, morphine and nitrates is that all three of them do produce some amount of venodilatation. Nitrate mainly act by venodilatation, okay? So, that is why they will end up reducing preload. That's how they act. That is also another pharmacology PYQ in the years gone by. Right. So, what about this ECG? 
obviously the rate in this is not very high so you can't say that this is tachycardia correct it's not less than the number of large squares or large boxes between successive qrs complexes not less than 3 so it's more than 3 okay so it's uh, probably 4 right so almost 5 so 5 almost large squares so it's not tachycardia but still since we're discussing tachy tachyrhythmias we will continue so in this if it is a is is it a wide complex or a narrow complex tachycardia it's not a tachycardia i know i know but let's presume that there is tachycardia so this is a narrow complex rhythm okay so the rhythm is narrow complex next you look at the regularity is it regular or irregular it is regular okay so regular narrow complex rhythm presumed to be tachycardia for purpose of discussion next look at the p wave is the p wave absent if it was a narrow complex tachycardia the, and with regular rhythm with absent p waves you would have thought of psvt but here the p waves are definitely there and in abundance okay there are more p waves than qrs complexes so too many p waves less qrs complexes narrow complex tachycardia with regularity then you have to think of atrial flutter very good sawtooth pattern f wave right so rate is increased narrow qrs rhythm is regular and p wave more than so p to qrs if you take a ratio of p to qrs the ratio is more than one so more p waves than qrs complex that is atrial flutter you can easily make out the p waves definitely it's not atrial fibrillation definitely it has to be atrial flutter okay so what is the history that they'll give you post cardiac surgery so cardiac surgery the most common arrhythmia after cardiac surgery is atrial flutter okay so you can revert this with dc shock also just 50 joules of dc shock would be enough it's a reentrant tachyrrhythmia no so that's why you can just give a it's a macro reentrant tachyrrhythmia okay so that is atrial flutter right so f waves these are called f waves where else do you see f waves you see f waves in nerve conduction studies in case of gb syndrome okay gb syndrome also f waves would be either delayed or maybe absent okay f waves in nerve conduction studies as well as in ecg ecg it is atrial flutter okay right very good all of you are doing very well in identifying the rhythm disorders in this these ecgs okay um, what about this one so clearly it's not a tachyrrhythmia it's in fact quite slow rhythm so number of large boxes between successive qrs complexes is quite quite many right so this is a quite slow rhythm it's a bradycardia but apart from that if you notice what else is abnormal i know that the qrs is wide but for for the time being focus on this what is this i'll give you a clue so this abnormality is actually considered a minor criterion so minor criterion in diagnosis of rheumatic fever okay acute rheumatic fever diagnosis modified jones it's a minor criterion provided that carditis is not major as long as carditis is not a major criterion you can use this prolonged pr interval finding as a minor criterion for modified jones diagnosis of diagnostic criteria for acute rheumatic fever okay so this is nothing but first degree av block so remember pr interval being prolonged should be first degree av block okay so yes first degree av block one of the clinical manifestations you will see is s1 being soft okay because as the the av node refractiveness increases the pr interval increases the closure of the mitral valve delays gets delayed and that is why the s1 becomes softer so as soft s1 is a manifestation of clinical manifestation of prolonged pr interval which is first degree av block okay next what about these two this was a question in ini november 2023 okay november 2023 this was the question so this rhythm you can see p q r s t p q r s t p q r s t and then p then nothing and then again p q r s t so what happened before that definitely you can notice that the p wave didn't get conducted in both these okay very similar here also both these p waves didn't get conducted but what's happened before that 
so very good second degree so undoubtedly there is a heart block and it's a second degree heart block the moment there are sinus rhythms or sinus complexes but in between there are missed or unconducted p waves they become second degree heart block first degree heart block there's no unconducted p waves every p wave is getting conducted just that the conduction is slowed down in the av node that's why there is a prolonged pr interval whereas in second degree av block intermittently there will be p waves which are not getting conducted like this one so this p wave didn't get conducted likewise here that's why you didn't have a qrs following it so there are dropped complexes or dropped conductions and therefore this has become second degree av block if you look at the first one the pr interval has successively gone prolonging okay the pr interval kept getting prolonged finally there was a missed beat missed unconducted p wave so this is what is wenke backs very good wenke back phenomenon type 1 mobitz type 1 that is okay second degree mobitz type 1 also known as wenke wenke backs phenomenon whereas in the second ecg you can notice pr interval never changed and out of the blue a p wave got dropped that means p wave didn't get conducted the sinus rhythm or the sinus node generated the p wave but didn't get conducted via the av node to the ventricles and therefore there was no qrs it went missing okay so this is an example of mobitz type 2 this is mobitz type 2 so please remember if the pr successfully prolongs and then the p wave doesn't get conducted conducted intermittently that is type 1 or it's type 1 second degree this is indeed second degree whereas if the pr remains constant and intermittently rather out of the blue okay, you can't predict it sometimes if like this if it continues like this every four for every four p waves three are conducted one is missed then it's fine you can predict when it's going to be missed but then sometimes it it it's very haphazard it's random so you may get two p waves conducted the third one not conducted that will be followed by three p waves conducted and the fourth one not conducted so it can vary a lot and that is the problem with mobitz type 2 mobitz um, i'm sorry i've written type 1 sorry so yes so that is the problem with mobitz type 2 it ends up it it's a high block that means it's a infra nodal block so it's in the bundle of his so any further if if it continues to get block like this it will very high risk of going into a complete heart block that is third degree av block okay third degree av block is going to be characterized by like this right so third degree av block there is going to be av dissociation okay so av dissociation so you can make out the p waves are coming by themselves okay p waves are coming by themselves they have no relation to when the qrs is coming so qrs is coming very delayed and it's wide it's wide because the ventricles are now trying to generate their rhythm so ventricular tissues their pacemaker activity is very very less very very low compared and they never needed it because every time the sinus used to send the impulses down through the av node now if the av node is totally blocked it's not allowing any sinus impulses to come down into the ventricles in that case you will get a ventricular rhythm that will be wide complex and will be very slow and it can be fatal also if the ventricle doesn't generate if it fails to generate its rhythm then it's as good as the atrium may may be contracting but the ventricles are not it's as good as patient developing asystole right so ventricle has to contract something has to allow the ventricle to contract if not the sinus rhythm it has to generate its own if it fails to it's fatal so that's why we are always worried when there is a second degree mobitz type 2 block or a third degree that means a complete av block okay so wide complex and you can make out when the qrs is wide no when it's coming from the ventricle the t wave the correspond that there'll be discordance okay the t wave will go in the opposite direction if it's a positive qrs in the same lead the t wave will become discordant it will become negative that means coming from the ventricles right so this is third degree av block what is the jvp sign you see in third degree av block so av dissociation is not exclusive to heart block so if if the patient is having bradycardia with av dissociation think of third degree av block if the patient is having tachycardia with third degree or rather with av dissociation then you think of ventricular tachycardia so ventricular tachycardia also there is going to be av dissociation but in that case it is the ventricles that have gone rogue they are acting when they not supposed to so they are contracting at a high speed so the ventricular rate would be greater than the atrial rate whereas in third degree av block the atrial rate would be greater than the ventricular rate so that is why because the av node is blocked okay so both these because of the av dissociation what jvp change would you see absent a wave would be a finding in atrial fibrillation where the contraction of the atrium is lost now it's only fibrillating so fibrillating a, a right atrium cannot produce an a wave 
So absent A wave is a finding of atrial fibrillation. Giant A wave. Good attempt, Brijesh. The problem is the terminology. So giant A wave is not entirely wrong. It's just convention that it's called con canon A waves. Very good. So Dr. Med, very, very correct. Canon A waves is what is the technical term you use for the JVP change that you see, the A wave that you see in patients with third degree AV blocker because of AV dissociation. Okay, so what would happen is intermittently the atrium would end up contracting this at the same time as the right ventricle. So right atrium and right ventricle contract together. That is because they are dissociated, their contraction, their rhythms are not related. So intermittently they'll contract together. So the right atrium would end up contracting against a closed tricuspid valve and that will produce uh, canon A wave. So canon A wave is a technical term, but you're not wrong in saying giant A waves. But for your exams, remember it as canon A waves. Giant A waves is what you associated associate with tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, I'll come shortly to JVP discussion also. That's also important. Okay, clear? Large A waves. Yes, so quickly revising. Quickly revising what we've learned. So if there is ventricular tachycardia, as a rhythm, you will expect the rate will be high, the complex would be wide, the rhythm would be regular, Most, for the most part it will be regular. P waves, actually it's, it's not very important, you may be able to make out, it will be AV dissociation if you are able to make out. And again, this also is not relevant. So, just with these two points, you should be able to make a diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia, wide complex tachycardia. Okay, Atrial fibrillation, there will be tachycardia, the complex would be narrow, it would be irregular and A waves will be absent. A wave absent, that is atrial fibrillation. PSVT, tachycardia, narrow complex, regular, again absent, that is P waves. Okay, MAT, tachycardia, narrow, irregular, three or more morphologies. Okay, atrial flutter, again tachycardia, narrow, regular, the P waves are present, but the ratio between P to QRS is more than one. Okay, I am sorry more than one, right? And then the two heart blocks. So this is only when you're seeing an irregular rhythm. So in between there are some QRSs that are not getting, that are not manifesting, then you'll think of an irregular rhythm. But generally these will be associated with uh, rather bradycardia. Okay, at least the tachyarrhythmias you try and be able to appreciate based on this small table. Okay, so try and put it into practice. It's always, it, it takes time, but with practice it gets easier. Okay, so right. Just a revision, tachycardia, QRS is wide, think of ventricular tachycardia, questions would be about treatment, immunodynamically unstable, DC shock, stable, can go with amiodarone procainamide, especially if it is post MI. Narrow complex, look at the rhythm, if it is irregular, could be AFib or MAT, AFib, number of manifestations, number of points important, okay, multifocal lateral tachycardia, COPD related, N regular and narrow complex, absent P waves, think of PSVT, treatment is initially vagal maneuver and then adenosine, okay, it will flutter post cardiac surgery. Okay, that is about tachyarrhythmias. Moving on, I think we're going a little slower than I planned. Anyway, so this is the a JVP. You guys know about the different waves in JVP. So the A wave is because of atrial contraction. C wave is because of the contraction of the right ventricle. So this was a PYQ where they asked, what does it coincide with? The C wave coincides with what? The answer would be isovolumetric contraction of the right ventricle. Okay, so the isovolumetric contraction of the right ventricle is what produces the C wave. Okay, so X is because of atrial relaxation. So the atria are trying to relax and become ready for receiving the blood that comes in through the pulmonary or rather through the systemic veins and that produces V. So when the atrium is getting filled, the right atrium is getting filled with the venous return, that time it will produce the V wave. So V for venous filling, the right atrium. Y is for atrial emptying. Okay, the atria, that, that's because the tricuspid valve opens, the atria empty into the ventricle and that produces the Y wave, the drop in pressure. Okay, the drop in pressure is the Y wave. What is important is, apart from these kind of questions, which they asked about timing. Okay, so obviously A wave would be after P wave in the ECG, right? P wave is what produces atrial depolarization that will finally get coupled, electromechanical coupling and then produce atrial contraction. The atrial contraction is what produces A wave in JVP. So the P wave in ECG will precede A wave in JVP. This is again another PYQ, previous year's question. And as I said, C wave timing is with isovolumetric contraction of the right ventricle. But apart from all these, the abnormalities in JVP, we already discussed atrial fibrillation, absent A wave. Okay, atrial fibrillation, 
is a condition where the A wave is absent in JVP and P wave is absent in ECG. Okay, giant A wave, tricuspid regurgitation and tricuspid stenosis rather. Okay, so tricuspid stenosis also produces a giant A wave. Even regurgitation could produce it. But it's more classical for, I'd rather say it's more classical for tricuspid stenosis. I'm sorry, tricuspid stenosis. Okay, canon A waves would be seen as we said in AV dissociation, third degree AV block, third degree AV block. And CV wave, Lancisi sign, these are seen in tricuspid regurgitation. So CV wave is a more prominent or a more important finding in patients of tricuspid regurgitation rather than a giant AV. Giant AV is for tricuspid stenosis. Okay, prominent X descent is something that you see in patients of, so remember the mnemonic pay tax. Okay, so in this, this is where it's prominent. Okay, so X wave will be prominent in cardiac tamponade. Okay, whereas Y wave will be what is prominent in constrictive pericarditis. Okay, so pay tax. So in prominent X descent, it is tamponade. Prominent Y descent, it is per constrictive pericarditis. Okay, and obliterated Y descent is something that you get in tamponade again. So tamponade, the X is prominent, but the Y is obliterated. Okay, so these are the abnormalities that you associate with JVP. These kind of questions would be anticipated. Okay, clinical questions are all, invariably they will ask. In INI, they love asking clinical based questions. Okay, so identify the abnormality. This was the ECG that was asked in the November INI and uh, it was a second degree AV block. Mobits type 2 second degree AV block. So if you notice, PR interval not changing and uh, the P wave, which is hidden here, that it doesn't get conducted. So that is without the PR interval changing and that is Mobitz type 2. Okay. Second degree infranodal block. So infranodal, okay, it's in the bundle of his below the level of the AV node. Right. Okay. So during which phase of the cardiac cycle would you anticipate the aortic regurgitation murmur to be heard? Okay. Is it systole or diastole? Aortic regurgitation. So basically, the ventricle, when it contracts, systole, right? So when the left ventricle, we mainly discuss left ventricular or left sided valvular heart disease. So when the ventricle contracts, there is going to be the blood flowing through the aortic valve with the closure of the mitral valve, correct? So there is no blood coming, there should be no blood coming through the mitral valve from the left ventricle into the left atrium and the blood should only flow through the aortic valve and that is systole. Okay, so instead, if during the contraction of the left ventricle, there is blood flowing not just through the aorta, but also into the left atrium through the mitral valve, it becomes mitral regurgitation, correct? So that means mitral regurgitation murmur, you hear it in systole. Whereas in aortic regurgitation, the blood will flow from the aorta into the left ventricle. So obviously it can't happen during systole because systole is generating a lot of hemodynamic pressure. So the blood cannot be flowing back during systole. It has to be during diastole, right? So it's a diastolic event. So if you had to depict the murmur, you would be depicting it somewhat like this. It's after S2, it will be a decrescendo murmur. Okay, early diastolic murmur. It's an early diastolic murmur. Whereas if you are given a murmur which is show, depicted like this, what would it be? So between S2 and the subsequent S1 is the diastole, correct? This is the diastolic period between S2 and the subsequent S1. So if the murmur began strong and then subsequently weaned off, that would be an early diastolic murmur of AR. Very good. Early, di early diastolic murmur in severe AR can produce austenal plane murmur, which is an MDM. Very good. Very good. Very good, Dr. Med. Yes, that is true. But Comparing, compar in comparison to this, what would this kind of murmur be depicting where it starts off in the mid diastole, like I told you, so diastole of the left ventricle is when the blood from the left atrium is supposed to flow through the mitral valve. So if there is turbulence around that time, that would be because of mitral stenosis. Very good. So there will be a mid diastolic murmur, it's a rumbling murmur, low pitched and there will be a pre-systolic accentuation. So once the left atrium contracts, this pre-systolic accentuation, so, uh, yeah, so the left atrium contracts, the pre-systolic accentuation occurs. So this is yet another phenomenon that is lost in atrial fibrillation. So in atrial fibrillation, you use, if the patient has a mitral stenosis, you lose the pre-systolic accentuation. You lose the A wave in JVP. You also lose any chance of S4. Okay. 
Correct. Very good. So diastolic murmurs, there are two. MS is mid-diastolic with pre-systolic accentuation and aortic regurgitation, which has a decrescendo pattern. But if like we discussed mitral regurgitation during systole, the blood is flowing from left ventricle into the left atrium. It's not supposed to. The mitral valve is supposed to be shut tightly, but it's not. It's damaged. It's incompetent. It's allowing backflow. So that will happen throughout the systole because the left ventricular pressures will be elevated in comparison to the left atrial pressure throughout the systole. So pan systolic murmur is what you associate with mitral regurgitation. Whereas as we already discussed, if there is a crescendo, decrescendo murmur in the systole, it is aortic stenosis. So, aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation and mitral, mitral stenosis. Okay. So, these are the phonocardiographic representations. Okay. So, yes, the murmur is likely to be heard during early diastole. That would be the right answer. But you can hear a, a nostril flint murmur also because of severe AR. Very good. Okay, yet another clinical based questions absent loud or uh, rather the S1 is not loud except which condition. So, in mitral stenosis you expect a loud S1, but in case there is a certain condition where it is not loud, which of these would not be one of them? That means basically which condition would the S1 continue to remain loud, whereas the other three it will remain soft or it will turn soft despite there being a severe MS. So, my severe mitral stenosis definitely you expect a loud S1. Do you expect in mild MS or do you expect it in valvular calcification if the mitral valve is calcified in associated MR or post valvotomy? Okay, this was the trick question they expected students to fall for, but mo may most of you have not, all of you have not. So, that is that's very good. MS. So, mild MS is not a condition where it will become soft. Mild MS also, it will remain loud only. That is because the left atrial pressures are higher because of mitral stenosis. The closure of the mitral valve occurs slightly low, later rather. So, because of the delayed closure, it shuts with a higher force because that is the time where the left ventricle is contracting at a very high pressure. So, the rate of rise in pressure, left ventricular pressure would be higher at that point. That is why it will shut the mitral valve with, a, with more force. That is why the S1 is louder in mild S MS also. Okay. In mild MS, moderate MS, severe MS, the S1 remains loud. Okay. Valvular calcification softens it. If there is a development of MR either because of the valve lesion itself or whether it is because of post valvotomy slight amount of mitral regurgitation that these can end up le leading to soft S1s. Okay. So, absent loud S1 that means S1 being soft can be seen in all except mild MS. Mild MS it will still be loud. Okay, this is how they had asked this exact question, which was asked in May I last year. Okay, so expect these kind of questions based on clinical cardiology. So they want to see if you guys have attended your clinical postings and been asked these kind of questions by your examiners. Okay, calcification leads to soft S1. Okay, even if a patient has severe mitral stenosis, once the valves get calcified, they're not going to move much, so they're not going to be shut or even open with with too much mobility. So, that is why it will end up producing a soft S1. Right. Okay. So, next question. This has been asked repeatedly now. Almost uh, every year they ask about n treatment. So, n treatment, remember when the, if it is a stable plaque, okay, a stable plaque rich in lipids, but has a good fibrous cap, not going to rupture anytime soon, producing stable angina. So, stable plaque, stable angina, effort dependent angina. That means you want to prevent it from pro progressing. You want to reduce the lipid content. So, you will give them statins. This is what you do to prevent any further worsening. You will also give them anti or rather you would end up giving them antiplatelets. Okay. So, antiplatelets just to make sure that the, even if there is a small rupture, there is not going to be any aggregation of platelets there. What if it is an unstable angina or NSTEMI? That means this plaque has now gone on to rupture and because it is ruptured, it is exposed its internal contents to the serum or the, to the plasma rather and that is why all the inflammatory markers or inflammatory cells would be activated and platelets would be activated. right? So, because of platelet aggregation, now there is a risk that this ruptured plaque is going to occlude the entire vessel and if you want to prevent that, you will obviously give them antiplatelet also 
but you have to prevent the next step if this is this continues platelets are the first responders but after bleeding time comes clotting time so you don't want that clotting time to get activated right so that means the coagulation factors you don't want them to get activated so you have to give them anticoagulants okay so anticoagulation is a must for nstemi otherwise once there are there is activation of the coagulation cascade this will turn into stemi okay you don't want that so if you want if there is a complete occlusion of the blood vessel because of a fibrin rich clot getting deposited that's going to be disastrous right so it's going to occlude the entire vessel so you don't want an nstemi or an unstable angina to turn into a stemi so to prevent that you have to give anticoagulation so the options here apart from antiplatelets you do need to give anticoagulation repeat repeat question several times okay biomarkers so please remember the important biomarkers now it's mainly troponin so you define myocardial infarction whether it's stemi or nstemi definition is based on biomarker elevation you need to demonstrate a rise or fall in cardiac biomarkers with at least one value being above the 99th percentile for that particular biomarker usually we use cardiac troponin either troponin i or troponin t right please also remember heart fatty acid binding protein if you are asked which is the biomarker cardiac biomarker which is earliest to rise it is heart fatty acid binding protein okay cardiac myoglobin would also come close but uh, this is the more reliable one what is the mechanism of brillantize it can't see this brillanta is uh, ticagrelor no so ticagrelor these are antiplatelets these are p2 white well inhibitors so p2 white well this is important for platelet aggregation so it's an adenosine receptor so adenosine it gets released once platelets adhere to the endothelium no when there's an endothelial damage that's going to end up freeing up the von willebrand factor so von willebrand factor will come it will pull the platelets towards it and attach to that platelet that's called adhesion platelet ad adhesion and once that happens platelets will start producing adenosine and that adenosine will start binding other platelets to it and that is called platelet aggregation so adhesion aggregation so this aggregation can be prevented if p2 y12 inhibitors are given p2 y12 is a receptor so you want to uh, give antagonists to this and one of them is ticagrelor or brillanta brillanta is the brand name okay so yes clear stable angina give them statins give them antiplatelets prevent nstemi if there's nstemi you want to prevent stemi give them statins antiplatelet along with anticoagulation keep that in mind okay if there's stemi take them up for coronary angiogram door to balloon time 90 minutes okay angioplasty right uh, i'm sorry these are things that i have already written down i will discuss them though right so next question was a patient with dyspnea cardiomegaly rails on auscultation which of the so it's basically heart failure heart failure treatment what do you give them so in an acute heart failure it's always lmnop you don't have to start anti remodeling drugs straight away for patients with acute heart failure wait for them to stabilize wait for them to become euvolemic okay when they're having rails on auscultation you can't give them drugs which have negative inotropic effect right so you cannot give them carvedilol you cannot give them beta blockers if they are having currently having pulmonary edema features so obviously carvedilol goes out digoxin the only role the current role for digoxin right now is in patients of refractory heart failure with tachycardia okay if there is a tachycardia and refractory heart failure if all other measures have failed then you can give digoxin otherwise very very seldom used okay digoxin is not used much okay furosemide must be initiated first so furosemide what would you say if the patient is having pulmonary edema lmnop right so loop diuretic furosemide has to be the first drug of choice so this is again similar to yet another question that was asked in neat where they had given an image of pulmonary edema and they had asked about what is the first drug to be given that is furosemide okay captopril is an ace inhibitor very good anti remodeling agent but this is not the time we not when the patient is having pulmonary edema let the patient become euvolemic you can initiate them because when you give them furosemide the blood pressures may drop so you want to you have to watch for all that you can start the anti remodeling drugs later okay so remember the anti remodeling drugs the latest one is sotagliflozin it's a combined sglt1 and 2 inhibitor and it's been approved for usage in heart failure verisigot verisigot is cyclic gmp stimulator okay gs 
GS stimulator. Okay, so very Sigwat. Very Sigwat sounds like Ryo Sigwat, no? Very Sigwat is a both acts very similarly. It's a GS stimulator, gonadotropin gon cyclase stimulator, which is used for heart failure. Very Sigwat. Ryo Sigwat is used in pulmonary hypertension. Okay, and uh, remember which are the drugs which have mortality benefit in heart failure? These include. Beta blockers, beta blockers including carbidolol. So, which are the beta blockers which have cardiac mortality benefit in heart failure? Which are the beta blockers which have cardiac mortality benefit in heart failure? You can remember it as carbidolol, metoprolol, and dash. So, you guys can tell me in the comment section which are the beta, the third beta blocker which has mortality benefit in heart failure. Other than these, of course, ACE inhibitor, ARB, these are the first agents to be started. And first anti remodeling agent to be started in patient with heart failure is always ACE inhibitor or ARB. Preferably ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitors are better at reducing the chances of left ventricular hypertrophy development. Okay, rather if, rather if, I'm sorry, Dharani, glaucoma was for mentioning for glaucoma. Okay, so yes. Uh, other than these, of course, we have SGLT2 inhibitors. They have proven mortality benefits. We have mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. Please remember, finernone is the recently approved drug. Recently, in the sense, been more than a year. And bisoprolol, very good. So, please remember bisoprolol, cardiac mortality benefit. Okay, so, carbidolol, metoprolol, and bisoprolol, these are the beta blockers which have cardiac mortality benefit. Also remember hydralazine. This is out of the blue, right? So hydralazine combination of hydralazine plus isosorbide dinitrate. Isosorbide dinitrate and hydralazine combination also has mortality benefit. Although individually they, neither of them have it, but as a combination they've been proven to have mortality benefit. So just like that. So when you're reading for INI or when you're reading for entrance preparations, no. Whenever you get the chance, revise. Whenever you try, you can connect the dots, connect. Okay, so you came across hydralazine. Immediately think of what are the other important points about hydralazine. It's a vasodilator, fine. So hydralazine has mortality benefit only with combination in, in combination with isosorbide dinitrate, no problem. But apart from this point, what else is important? Hydralazine is very often associated as a high propensity to develop drug-induced lupus. So drug-induced, drug-induced lupus. Okay. Hydralazine. So, what are the other drugs that can produce drug induced lupus? Hydralazine, procainamide. We discussed procainamide in ventricular tachycardia. And drugs like INH, drugs like phenytoin. Okay, all these are drugs which can have a tendency to produce drug induced lupus. Remember, if a male patient develops lupus, always think of drug induced lupus. They must have received one of these drugs which ended up producing their joint pains, their pleuritis. Okay, these are manifestations. Drug induced lupus, positive for which antibody? Specific antibody for drug induced lupus. And final thing about hydralazine, pregnancy. Very good in pregnancy. Pregnancy, you can also use beta blockers. You should not use ACE inhibitors. That is again another PYQ. Right? So you get a chance, you saw hydralazine, you try and relate to where else did you see hydralazine? What was important about what are the important points about hydralazine? The more you can do that, the easier it will be for you to revise. So it's not like you give one reading. Everybody reads for one one time. One reading everybody does. Okay. So the, what makes the difference is how many times you are able to revise, how well were you able to revise. So it's not about the entire content having to be finished. Even if you read only 70% of what you are what you're supposed to, what you plan to, but that 70% you revised very well, will make the world, world of difference. Okay. So that's why we snuck in a revision point about idealism. I'm sorry. Yes. So one more question which was asked, Bath syndrome defect is seen in cardiolipin. It's actually tougher than Tafazin protein, but tafazin cardiolipin is important for tafazin functioning. And cardiolipin, the other important points include that the the anti-cardiolipin antibodies are important antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, as well as in uh, it it's what is tested for VDRL, right? So in VDRL, you test for anti-cardiolipin antibodies, and that's why you get false positive VDRL test in patients with antiphospholipid antibodies. Very good. Ernie has answered anti histone antibodies. Very good. Ship, sulfur drugs, yes, sulfur drugs and hydralazine, yes, INH. These are the drugs which can produce drug induced lupus. Okay. So, this was again another question Bath syndrome. So, titan gene mutation can produce dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. I'll give you a, sh a short break. Okay. I don't want to be too monotonous also. Although, 
I I really like discussing medicine, but I can understand for the other person it may not be it might seem a little dry. So I always try and put a a few bits here and there to try and make it a little interesting and break the monotony. So likewise, what do you think? Which disease is this describing? So you can see that there is a uh, an octopus which has gone off on a hot air balloon ride from the apex of the mountain, and now it is seeing a stunning view. So much so that that stunning view has almost broken the octopus heart and the octopus is sitting on a pot also so what could this be while you think about it i'll also show you show you this one what do you think this is so the left ventricle is telling the right ventricle that the body has grown fatter okay very good Dr. Med, Dr. Potter, very good. You guys are right. This is Takotsubo, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, very similar to myocardial infarction. You know, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. The patient would have received some bad news, and that would have triggered off acute chest pain, very intense, and they may even go into shock. So they brought to the emergency room, and then because they have chest pain, you did the ECG. ECG showed ST elevations, not necessarily contiguous ST elevations, contiguous leads. Okay, they may represent different areas of the heart. Okay, for example, lead one and lead two will have ST elevations. Lead one and lead two don't represent the same area of the heart. No, lead one represents a left side. It's a left-sided lead. Lead two is an inferior lead. But non-contiguous leads with ST elevations, that is when you start doubting. But still, you got ST elevation. You sent cardiac enzymes. The cardiac enzymes came back positive. The patient has elevated cardiac enzymes. By definition, if the cardiac enzymes are po positive and the ECG changes are there, that is definition of universal definition of myocardial infarction. So you are really worried. You did an echo also, just to be sure. Echo also showed wall motion abnormalities. So everything is pointing towards myocardial infarction. Okay, what wall motion abnormality you see is a stunned myocardium. A stunned myocardium where the apex would be ballooned. Okay, so the apical ballooning is seen. Apex is ballooned, whereas the free wall would be hyperkinetic. So a hyperkinetic free wall with apical ballooning is what is seen in patients of Takotsubo. So all this led to you having to uh, end up. Taking the patient to angio, and in the angiogram is where you discover that there is apical ballooning. I am so sorry, Doc Potter. Uh, I am sorry for your loss for what you mentioned. But that that's how it is. This uh, Takotsubo can be very very similar to myocardial infarction. You only discover it on angiogram that there was an apical ballooning and not a coronary angio or a coronary artery blockage. Okay, so very close differential to myocardial infarction. And you guys are right. This is no doubt. arrhythmogenic right ventricular dyspepsia okay again yet another situation where the patient will have sudden collapse look for epsilon waves okay the, it's a misnomer it's not just restricted right ventricle there will be fibro fatty tissue so this is common in cardiomyop or rather muscle disorders right is there a skeletal muscle disorder where because of a protein defect the muscle gets replaced with fibro fatty tissue leading to pseudo hypertrophy a skeletal muscle disorder that also can be associated with a dilated cardiomyopathy you guys can tell me okay so hypertension based questions uh, if a patient has hypertension with elevated blood glucose levels what antihypertensive would you prefer hydrochlorothiazide uh, the problem with hydrochlorothiazide is thiazides can inhibit insulin release can aggravate blood glucose control or rather can worsen blood glucose control therefore do avoid that metoprolol likewise not preferred as a first line antihypertensive among the first line antihypertensives the only other choice is telmisartan telmisartan has additional gamma ppar activity agonistic activity and therefore in diabetics it's a preferred arb duchenne's very good duchenne's muscular dystrophy is definitely what is the the same this, a similar pathology where there is replacement of muscle tissue with fibro fatty tissue that leads to pseudo hypertrophy of calves pseudo hypertrophy of calves okay clonidin definitely not a first line antihypertensive it's it has limited duration of action you need to give it multiple times and sudden withdrawal can lead to rebound hypertension so not preferred as a first line can be given for resistant hypertension resistant hypertension was also asked uh, i think it was last year or maybe in 2022 but resistant hypertension was asked and which class of diuretics must be must be, must the patient be taking include so it's the definition was given three or more antihypertensives including at least one dash okay which class and the answer was diuretic so they should be taking at least one diuretic along with two other antihypertensives at their maximum tolerated doses 
despite which their blood pressure is not under control for us, for us to call them as resistant hypertension. In patients with resistant hypertension, the first additional antihypertensive you add is not clonidine, but mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Okay. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Goversign, very good. Goversign is what is seen in patients of Duchenne's. They try and climb upon themselves. Right. So, cardiology, I have actually not, I barely scratched the surface, but that's how it is. I need to finish this today's session as much as possible. So, I will continue. Uh, please don't think that whatever I have discussed is the only thing that you need to focus on. This is just a, a help, uh, a guide for you guys to, to try and stimulate you to revise i hope you all are revising as i said please revise what you have read okay just a month before exam if you are seriously appearing for ini don't read anything new just revise what you've already read you've already read a lot okay trust yourselves you've forgotten that's all it's a natural thing it happens to everybody what you read today 20 days later you will not remember it that's how it is that's the nature the volatile nature of what we are trying to or what you guys are trying to read up okay spinal lactone given in start Re restart okay Yes, correct. So basically, you give aldosterone antagonists, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists for patients with uh, resistant hypertension because Kohn syndrome is quite quite common. It's underdiagnosed. Okay, so aldosterone increased aldosterone secretion may be the reason for the resistant hypertension. OSA obstructive sleep apnea is again another cause of resistant hypertension. Okay, so unless OSA is corrected, the resistant hypertension may not. So secondary causes of secondary hypertension, you guys must be aware, endocrine causes, including pheochromocytoma, thyrotoxicosis, hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease, okay, and uh, renal causes, these include renal artery stenosis, okay, uh, glomulopathies, gl acute nephritic syndrome, including uh, even TTP, TTP HUS also can produce secondary hypertension. So number of causes which you have to try and revise, okay. Moving on to nephrology. ABG, ABG related questions, very high yield. Okay, there are, if there are if there are three areas where I know for sure they will ask you questions based on one is ECG, one is ABG. Okay, and the third one comes in neurology, and that is about cortical functions. So these three they will definitely if you have to read Harrison, read these three chapters, including at least ABG. ABG is a not a very lengthy chapter. Okay, so and they definitely ask questions based on it. So please be thorough with ABG. Uh, regarding causes and compensation of different acid based disorders, electrolytes, glomulopathies, complications of CKD uh, and uh, hemodialysis. Now, glomulopathies has been discussed by Ranjana ma'am just a few days back, so I will not be going there. Okay, I'm sorry, these notes are still here. Right, so question asked last year was calculate the anion gap. Remember, don't take into account potassium for anion gap. We don't. Okay, potassium levels are affected by pH and therefore we don't consider potassium and in general the level of potassium in comparison to sodium is negligible so that's why for calculation of anion gap we only use sodium and we subtract the sum of bicarbonate and chloride okay so that will give you the anion gap so here in this case 145 minus 90 plus 20 that's 110 so obviously you get the answer as one as 35 rather okay so the normal anion gap is up to 12 but by by convention we take it to be somewhere you can even extend it's it's rather from 8 to 12 so you can take it to be 10 also yeah so 10 anything anytime it's about 10 clearly about 10 you should take it as abnormal correct so that's anion gap so what raises anion gap will be organic acids so organic acids which are anionic and therefore the anion gap will be elevated and that can occur either because of endogenous acids or exogenous acids Endogenous acids would include lactic acid and keto acids, right? And exogenous acids could be a variety of toxic alcohols, including methanol, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, isopropyl alcohol, toxic alcohols, okay? As they are degraded, no? As the alcohol gets broken down into aldehyde, gets broken down into acid. And this acid raises the proton levels and therefore the pH drops. Okay, so DK, very good. So diabetic ketoacidosis. So ketoacidosis could again be diabetes related. It could be starvation related. It could be alcohol related. So alcoholic ketoacidosis is also there. And what you should watch out for is a potential question on euglycemic ketoacidosis. So euglycemic ketoacidosis is caused by which drug, which anti-diabetic drug. So the problem with that, you know, in a patient with euglycemic ketoacidosis is you, your treatment will not be based on sugar or uh, the blood glucose, your treatment would be based on anion gap, okay? Till the anion gap normalizes, you need to continue giving them insulin infusion. 
so it's a tricky thing you need to give them dextrose also so you start with dextrose along with insulin in treatment of euglycemic ketoacidosis which is a side effect of an anti diabetic drug very very good drug but that is why we don't give it in critical patients so critically ill patients avoid this oral anti diabetic agent because it can lead to euglycemic ketoacidosis the potential question because it's it's not straight forward no patient sugar may be given as 150 and the patient has presented with elevated levels of anion gap as well as beta hydroxybutyrate so you do a serum beta hydroxybutyrate it comes elevated so you are you are stuck now what do you do so sugars are not high if the patient has beta hydroxybutyrate levels being high you need to control that you need to give insulin but you can't give insulin just like that when the sugars are only 150 you need to give it with dextrose and till when do you give you look at the anion gap till the anion gap normalizes or till the beta hydroxybutyrate levels normalize okay so watch out for that question right so uh, dr med said rta are normal yes rta are normal anion gap metabolic acidosis not metformin metformin leads to high anion gap metabolic acidosis metformin leads to something called type b type b l lactic acidosis okay lactic acidosis can be l lactate and d lactate d lactate comes from the intestines l lactate can again be type a type b type a is because of hypoxia hypoxia meaning it could be because of shock it could be because circulatory circulatory failure it could be because of even carbon monoxide poisoning or even because of cyanide so cyanide if you are asked cyanide produces type a l lactic acidosis whereas metformin ducts like metformin produce type b l lactic acidosis okay sglt2 inhibitors very good sglt2 inhibitors watch out for that if you are treating a patient who is sick who is critical with type 2 diabetes with sglt2 inhibitors it might precipitate something called you might see that ph dropping you might see anion gap increasing you if you do a beta hydroxybutyrate test it will come positive patient may be having ha- ha- having gone into euglycemic ketoacidosis right so toxic alcohols aspirin remember aspirin needs to be treated with bicarbonate right aspirin toxicity you give you you do something called forced alkaline diuresis for aspirin that also can produce can paracetamol produce paracetamol can it produce acidosis paracetamol does it produce acidosis lactic or rather not lactic acidosis does it does it produce acidosis does it produce metabolic acidosis with the ph dropping paracetamol aspirin it does aspirin definitely does aspirin also produces produces respiratory alkalosis right it stimulates the respiratory centers produces respiratory alkalosis along with metabolic acidosis because it's a nasidic compound acetyl salicylic acid that's aspirin what about paracetamol paracetamol acetaminophen does acetaminophen produce if okay dr med said yes why but you guys know the answer would be something called pyroglutamic acid okay no problem pyroglutamic acid is what is produced when paracetamol is metabolized in critically ill patients so even a seemingly small dose of paracetamol given to critically ill patients can produce something called pyroglutamic acid which again is acidic okay so it's not just aspirin even paracetamol can be associated with metabolic acidosis okay so sorry about all this right patient recurrent vomiting obviously you expect the patient is losing hcl so once they have lost hcl definitely chloride levels will also go down proton levels will also go down so that means the patient will have metabolic alkalosis and they will have hypochloremia and as a result they will also have hypokalemia hypokalemia is because when there is vomiting there is a drop in intravascular volume that will so because there is reduced intravascular volume there is going to be increased ras activation secondary so secondary hyperaldosteronism will finally lead to hypokalemia right in general even alkalosis itself can lead to hypokalemia because the potassium shifts inside the cells but even because of ras activation the potassium levels will drop so all these are expected respiratory alkalosis is not what you expect metabolic alkalosis should trigger a compensatory respiratory acidosis so their breathing rate the respiratory rate should come down okay so that is why we fear metabolic alkalosis i'm sorry metabolic alkalosis for example in patients of copd so a patient of copd patient presented with corpulmonary it was a chronic bronchitis patient so you know chronic bronchitis patients are blue bloaters they have developed corpulmonary because of that you give them diuretics you give them furosemide and once you give furosemide you all know that furosemide can also lead to metabolic alkalosis right so the same pathway it will reduce it will produce diuresis it will reduce intravascular volume that will produce ras activation secondary hyperaldosteronism and it will lead to 
metabolic alkalosis. As a result of the metabolic alkalosis, there is a compensatory respiratory acidosis. So the breathing slows down. So COPD patient who may already be in type 2 respiratory failure. So chronic bronchitis is the most common cause of type 2 respiratory failure because of hypoventilation. Okay. But if you gave them diuretic, you triggered metabolic alkalosis and in compensation to that, they ended, ended up developing respiratory acidosis that worsened their type 2 respiratory failure. You don't want further hypoventilation already when the CO2 levels are high. So these are certain concerns we have practically. Okay, so remember the causes of metabolic alkalosis, it's related to uh, volume. So when the volume levels go down, it's called contraction alkalosis. So because of contraction of intravascular volume, there is secondary RAS activation leads to development of alkalosis okay so alkalosis as a result of ras activation ras activation will also lead to reduced proton levels okay so protons will get excreted along with potassium therefore there will be hypokalemia there will be metabolic alkalosis okay so causes of acidosis causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis okay one point i did not mention was about anion gap so keep in mind when you are calculating this is again a pyq that's why i'm mentioning it anion gap when you are calculating anion gap keep in, keep in mind what is the albumin level because Albumins attach. Albumin is basically, it is also an anion, right? So that is why calcium attaches to it and protons attach to it, correct? So albumin is also anion and that is why the in the glomerulus, it gets repelled by the, the glomerular filtration barrier, which is again negatively charged. So this is again an anion, right? So when the albumin levels are low, you need to correct for the hypoalbuminemia in calculating the anion gap. So you calculate the difference between the serum albumin from 4.5. So you take 4.5 as the cutoff minus the serum albumin of the patient. Okay. So minus the serum value of the patient. Yes, you should take the corrected value, Dr. Met. You should take the corrected value after calculating 4.5 minus serum albumin. This is what you need to apply to the anion gap. Okay. So and this is to be rather multiplied by 2.5. I'm sorry. This is to be multiplied by 2.5. So 2.5 into this uh, difference, 4.5 minus serum albumin. Okay. So while we are on at this point, on this point, we also look at calcium. So when the albumin levels are low, you also correct for calcium. No, the difference is there you take 4 as the cutoff, 4 minus serum albumin, and there you multiply it by 0.8. Okay. So remember these two corrections that you need to apply when albumin levels are low anion gap needs to be corrected using this formula sorry and calcium also needs to be corrected using this formula okay corrected calcium levels right so that is why when a person hyperventilates what happens because of carbon dioxide washout there is a respiratory alkalosis that sets in in order to compensate for the respiratory alkalosis the protons detach from albumin and that allows calcium to come and bind to albumin right and that is why the person may end up developing carpopedal spasms, they may end up developing somewhat features similar to tetany, but full blown tetany is unlikely in pure hyperventilation. Okay. So, right. So what is the diagnosis in a six COPD patient who has a pH of 7.3? 7.3 means the patient has acidosis, correct? Whenever the patient has normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Okay. 7.45. So whenever the pH drops below 7.35, it's acidosis. When it rises above 7.45, it's alkalosis. So if the direction of change of pH and PCO2 and bicarb is the same, then it is a metabolic process. If the direction of change of these two in comparison to pH is opposite, then it is a respiratory process. That's how you initially differentiate. Okay. If the pH has dropped and the carbon dioxide and bicarbonate have dropped. So remember, Carbon dioxide and bicarbonate change will always be in the same direction, no matter what. As long as it's a single acid-based disorder, if the if it's a respiratory acidosis, for example, if the respiratory acidosis, PCO2 has been retained, bicarbonate will always rise. Okay. If the PCO2 got washed out, likewise, bicarbonate will also reduce. Okay. So the direction of change of bicarbonate and PCO2 is always the same. But the pH, if the pH change and the change of these two, the direction is the same then you consider it to be a primary metabolic process. If it is different, like in this case, the pH has dropped, but PCO2 has risen. Normal PCO2, you'll take it as 40. Normal bicarbonate, you take it as 24. Correct? So the PCO2 has risen, the bicarbonate has risen, but the pH has dropped, which means it's a respiratory process. 
and obviously there is acidosis so it's a respiratory acidosis this much is clear and therefore all four options have respiratory acidosis correct now to check whether it's due to hyperventilation with adequate compensation or hypoventilation with adequate compensation and the various combinations so is there hyperventilation to begin with no because co2 if there was hyperventilation it will lead to co2 washout co2 levels reducing so co2 levels are high that means definitely not these two it's hypoventilation for sure and after that you need to check for bicarbonate levels as well as the ph okay the first thing you look for is the ph to check if there is adequate compensation or without adequate compensation if there is adequate compensation the ph should have normalized okay the ph should have normalized but here the ph is 7.3 Okay. In any case, let us calculate whether the compensation from the bicarbonate is adequate or not. So we need to find out how much has the PCO2 risen by. So whenever there's a rise in PCO2 as a process or in the process of respiratory acidosis, for every 10 millimeter mercury rise in PCO2, it should be associated with a compensatory rise in bicarbonate by if it is an acute process, if acute respiratory acidosis, the rise will only be one milliequivalent versus chronic it will be 4 milliequivalent so as the process becomes more chronic the kidneys become more efficient in saving bicarbonate and therefore the response improves but then in acute respiratory acidosis it will be quite poor so here the patient has developed respiratory acidosis with pco2 jumping i'm sorry pco2 jumping to 80 so that means if the cutoff is 40 80 minus 40 it's risen by 40 so for a rise in pco2 of 40 we should have had a rise in bicarbonate by Four. If it was as acute acidosis, acute respiratory acidosis, it should have risen by risen by four milliequivalents. If it was chronic, then it should have risen by sixteen. Correct. So in this case, it has risen by four. Okay. So if this were to be depicting a sick patient, sick COPD patient with pH of seven point three, then you have to consider that it might be an acute respiratory acidosis, in which case it becomes compensated. Okay. So 7.3 is quite close to 7.35. So in which case, because of this matching to what is given in the equation, our calculated uh, the compensation of bicarbonate for this level of PCO2 is matching to the patient's scenario. Maybe the patient had acute respiratory acidosis. This becomes an adequate compensation. So hypoventilation, respiratory acidosis due to hypoventilation with adequate compensation. Clear? So in this case, we will have to take this into account okay if it was chronic if they had mentioned that the patient had chronic hypoventilation then we could have taken as without adequate compensation okay yeah so these kind of questions are very frequently asked 7.3 becomes tricky since it's not normalized we have to now decide whether the bicarbonate values are somewhat as expected or not. So in this case, because they are coming close to what was expected. Yeah, Dr. Vishma is asking, since it's chronic. Yeah, so we don't know if they wouldn't have needed to mention sick. No, if they mentioned sick, it probably means there is an acute component. So in an acute component, now if the pH is 7.3, yes, doesn't seem like it's compensated, but maybe it's trending towards it. What is more important is are our values matching or not. So for a rise in bicarbonate by 40, in an acute acidosis, it should have risen by 4, which in case, which in this case it has. So the fact that they mentioned a 6 COPD patient tends to bring, tends to gain more importance from this point of view. Okay. So if the patient, if they had mentioned only chronic, the patient is on a patient of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who is not in exacerbation, not sick, then perhaps we could have taken it as not compensated. Okay. Acute respiratory acidosis, this matches up purely the bicarbonate value, not the pH yet. Maybe the pH will eventually, but not yet. So these are important values that you, you should know. Okay. The remember the, whenever there is a metabolic process, there is going to be a change in bicarbonate and PCO2 in the same direction. Okay. Whereas in uh, respiratory, it's going to be in the opposite direction and the compensation values. Remember whenever the other entity has to rise, whether it's PCO2 or bicarbonate, when it, when it has to rise, it's more difficult. So that is why the compensation in respiratory metabolic alkalosis, where I'm sorry, the arrows are wrong, where the values are rising for each milli equivalent rise in bicarbonate, each milli equivalent rise in bicarbonate, there's going to be an increase in PCO2 by one point or 0 0.275. 
okay 0.75 so the rise is always little tougher than the fall in acidosis i'm sorry in acidosis the bicarbonate levels when it drops metabolic acidosis when the bicarbonate levels drop the the, the expected drop in pso2 is 1.25 so for each 1 milliequivalent drop in bicarbonate levels there will be an uh, expected or anticipated compensation by 1.25 millimeters of mercury of pso2 okay so keep in mind that the rise is always more difficult likewise in respiratory also so in respiratory also i'm sorry where did this go in respiratory acidosis also the pso2 is rising so therefore the compensatory rise in the compensatory rise in bicarbonate would be little more difficult for acute respiratory acidosis acute respiratory acidosis the rise will only be one milliequivalent whereas in chronic the kidneys improve and therefore four milliequivalent rise with 10 mm rise in pso2 alkalosis the drop is little better so acute respiratory alkalosis the drop is two milliequivalents for every 10 mm mercury drop in pso2 whereas for chronic again it is four okay so 1424 acidosis alkalosis please memorize these these will help you to determine exactly if there is compensation or not okay so 1.25 0.75 these are usually they don't ask calculation based questions but you have to be ready for them okay this is a formula how to calculate osmolar gap so just as a break so you can remember the formula as two salty and sweet buns okay so bun stands for blood urea nitrogen and salty that means two salty that's two times sodium plus blood glucose okay so that's sweet so two salt or two salty and sweet buns is a formula for calculating plasma osmolarity remember when you are you do, you're calculating in millimole per liter you need not apply any corrections but if you are calculating in milligram per deciliter you need to add or you you need to correct blood glucose divided by 18 and blood urea nitrogen divided by 2.8 okay these correction factors you need to apply when the values are in milligram per deciliter why this is important is there are certain causes of high osmolar gap high anion gap metabolic acidosis which includes toxic alcohols toxic alcohols like ethylene glycol methanol okay methanol poisoning they'll give you history of the there there being vision issues okay vision problems along with the high anion gap high osmolar gap metabolic acidosis and in ethylene glycol the patient would have consumed coolant or antifreeze and then developed calcium oxalate crystals in urine and then developed metabolic acidosis with high osmolar gap so remember high osmolar gap is given by what osmolarity you derive from the lab lab derived osmolarity minus calculated osmolarity so what you got by calculation and what the lab gave you the value the lab gave you if they are different if they are significantly different generally the difference more than 15 then you consider that the patient has a high osmolar gap so if this high osmolar gap is associated with high anion gap metabolic acidosis you can think of toxic alcohols okay right so again an abg question abg is showing ph 6.9 PO2 is 80, PCO2 is 55, bicarbonate and is 10. Okay, and the repeat ABG. This was a November I9 question. After two hours, the ABG uh, the pH rather improved to 7.1. PO2 increased to 100. PCO2 ended up becoming 20, and bicarbonate remained 10. So, how do you explain the second ABG? So, if if the question is how do you explain the second ABG? Basic differences are the pH has improved. along with the bicarbonate having improved okay so in fact it's become less bicarbonate was quite high initially now it's become less and along with that the the bicarbonate has not changed the carbon dioxide has reduced okay so carbon dioxide is reduced but the bicarbonate has not changed so how do you explain the second abg is it because of heparin excess so what heparin does is it's an acidic compound so whenever heparin is present in a particular solution it will reduce the ph so if the ph has increased that means the person or rather when when adding heparin the amount of heparin has definitely not increased because the ph has improved if the ph has increased that means there is no question of excess heparin so if the if the ph had dropped further you could have thought of excess heparin but in this case it's not so so remember heparin is going to be acidic it brings down the ph 
okay since here the ph has increased that's not the case what about the pao2 pao2 is actually increased okay so second abg pao2 is increased so this could also be due to 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 do with the improvement of the patient also so but among the options that option is not there or among in this question the option is not there and therefore you would have to go for excess air only so less rather excess hair and less heparin would have to be the correct answer so if you are talking about the second abg second abg if the pao2 has increased it's because the air has increased that has caused the oxygen levels to come up and the ph has actually ended up increasing okay so this is how this is a more practical question and this is how aims tends to ask related to practice right so expect these kind of questions also sometimes in between but what you expect what you, you should know is heparin ends up reducing it's an acidic compound it reduces ph and therefore you expect the ph to drop the second ph should have dropped but it's not it's risen that means it is got to be no no question of excess heparin instead the o2 levels have gone up that means among these options excess air with less heparin is the best one okay so this was what was asked in november okay so which of these is not useful for management of hyperkalemia this is again a very emergency based questions are very common in ini so hyperkalemia management remember everything is 10 so you give them 10% of 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate over 10 minutes okay this is this is not going to do anything to the potassium levels it's only going to stabilize the cardiac membrane and if you are seeing tall t waves okay tall t waves let me show it as this this is the qrs and you see tall tented t waves narrow base narrow based tall t waves in ecg you have to think of hyperkalemia if you see this that means the cardiac membrane is unstable it may throw an arrhythmia any time so that is why immediately you need to give them calcium gluconate you need to give it slowly over 10 minutes 10% 10 ml okay likewise mag uh, insulin insulin is 10 units you give 10 units you look at the blood glucose levels if the blood glucose levels are very high you don't even need to give dextrose just give 10 units of insulin okay if the patient has normal blood glucose you don't want to give insulin for its glucose lowering property you want to give insulin to for, for its potassium lowering property so that is why you need to add it to dextrose if in case the blood glucose levels are normal or on the lower side so add it to dextrose 50% or 25% dextrose and give it but the main thing you want is the insulin to act so this is the this is one of the faster acting medications for lowering potassium levels but the fastest acting would have to be salbutamol so albutamol is the other name for salbutamol salbutamol is a beta 2 agonist so you give salbutamol via nebulization you give it a higher dose and that is also 10 mg okay 10 to 20 mg at least 10 mg of salbutamol along with 10 units of insulin and calcium gluconate so everything is 10 please remember this is acute management of hyperkalemia for more sustained or maintenance of anti hyperkalemic measures you can give resins okay potassium binding resins you can also give patiromer patiromer is a newer drug and uh, you can al also give the can you name another drug which you can give for treatment of hyperkalemia for maintenance of hyperkalemia apart from patiromer one more drug okay but that is for maintenance not in acute hyperkalemia okay magnesium sulfate has no role in treatment of hyperkalemia magnesium actually ends up if if magnesium levels are low then you can lead to it can lead to refractory hyperkalemia hypokalemia refractory hypokalemia okay but no role for magnesium in treatment of hyperkalemia okay right so hyperkalemia management is also important okay this was another question that was asked in may of 2023 pocket about which of the following statements is incorrect pocketin is biopsy not needed to diagnose fsgs so clearly you do need it right so fsgs is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis unless you can visualize this on under the microscope you can't make a diagnosis so fsgs definitely requires a biopsy minimal change may not require a biopsy if it's in a in a child so if a child who has developed typical minimal change disease the all the components of nephrotic syndrome then you can try giving us trial of steroids need not have to do a biopsy and nowadays even membranous nephropathy membranous nephropathy need not be it it i'm not saying this as a I, I, this is a practical point okay no books will give you this but membranous nephropathy is more and more getting diagnosed based on a serology an antibody test i'll come to that also but fsgs for sure we have no choice you you suspect fsgs in a patient who has who is an adult okay an adult who has developed nephrotic syndrome 
the most common cause is FSDS. So you do need to subject them to biopsy to make a diagnosis. Okay. Postnatal biopsy, the patient should be observed for 24 hours. That sounds like a true statement. Passage of clots indicates hematoma formation. That's again quite logical. Systemic amyloidosis patients with renal dysfunction must always undergo renal biopsy. Okay, whenever you see among the options, if this kind of a multiple option filter kind of a, a question, you whenever you come across always or never, whenever you see these kind of words in medicine, it's exceedingly difficult to prove or disprove. Okay, statements like always and never, those are always difficult to prove or disprove. So these will usually be distractors. So if you see always or never mentioned in any of these options, you it should raise your eyebrows, you should neglect that option. Okay, so if they're asking for which is correct, then you neglect it. If you're asking for what is incorrect, you start suspecting if that this is incorrect. Okay, so always and never very, very difficult. So anyway, coming back to the statement itself, amyloidosis patient should undergo with renal dysfunction should undergo renal biopsy. So you need not have to, if it's a systemic amyloidosis, you need not have to take the biopsy from the kidneys. You can take it from the abdominal fat pad, you can even take a rectal biopsy. Okay, a renal biopsy would be slightly more invasive. So you can do it with lesser invasive methods. So it's not a compulsion, not a necessary investigation. So that is why this statement would, statement would be incorrect. This also should be incorrect. And therefore the answer is A and D. Okay. So it's, it's again uh, something more to do with practical. So this fact about monitoring the patient for 24 hours and the passage of clots could indicate hematoma formation. These are all more practical points that they have tried to ask in the past. Okay. So this is what I was talk talking about. Membranous nephropathy need not be diagnosed. Okay. This is not for your INI. Okay. The importance of this question is to only highlight which antibody is associated with it. But membranous nephropathy need not have to be diagnosed with biopsy these days practically i am saying you can make an indirect diagnosis but for your ini exams diagnosis requires biopsy you want to this you want to reveal the spike in dome pattern membranous nephropathy okay but which is the antibody that is associated with membranous nephropathy this was asked by ranjana ma'am in her prepathon just a couple of days back also so why i have shown this is so this is the glomerulus trying to eat up the albumin Membranous nephropathy is notorious for the amount of proteinuria it pr produces. So it produces a lot of proteinuria. It will end up producing such defects in the glomerular filtration barrier that a lot of proteins are lost. Even large proteins are lost. Large proteins like antithrombin 3. Antithrombin 3 is also lost. So because of large proteins like this being lost, antithrombin 3 is a natural anticoagulant. If that is lost, there is going to be a high risk for procoagulant state. So membranous nephropathy, remember, very high proteinuria very high risk for procoagulation so clotting risk very high okay and unfortunately what happens is this blood that is coming in through the afferent and efferent going out through the efferent arterioles this blood has just lost lost its antithrombin 3 so as it's getting drained through the renal veins there itself the coagulation factors may be so high not getting inhibited by any antithrombin 3 there there itself the blood may clot so that is why it it ends up producing something called renal vein thrombosis. So renal vein thrombosis is a complication seen in membranous nephropathy in the veins itself, renal vein itself. And when the renal vein thrombosis develops, the patient will experience ipsilateral flank pain. They'll end up having hematuria. The proteinuria will also worsen because finally back pressure, right? So renal vein, the pressure is, can be traced back all the way to the glomerulus and the glomerular pressures are increased, more proteinuria. A protein you someone who was a membranous nephropathy patient who was responding initially to uh, uh, immunosuppressives they may end up becoming more res more resistant protein urea increases and unfortunately renal vein is in continuity with the inferior vena cava so that thrombus may dislodge may end up coming into the right side of the heart lodging in the pulmonary arteries and that may end up producing pulmonary embolism so all these are complications possible in membranous nephropathy that you need to keep in mind okay so very good Saurabh has replied PLA2R that is phospholipase A2 receptor antibodies to phospholipase A2 receptor these are now being more and more used to try and make a diagnosis of membranous nephropathy but of course that is not a substitute not yet not a substitute for renal biopsy please keep that in mind very good Dharani also the other antibody that is positive in membranous nephropathy patients are is thrombospondin 7A antibodies to thrombospondin 7A receptors okay 
so that is about membranous nephropathy also keep in mind gentleman little and barter syndrome okay so these are also very frequently asked remember any patient who has metabolic alkalosis you automatically think of these three as possible causes okay the difference being barters very much like loop diuretic effects the patient will not have hypertension they'll have they'll, they'll be normal tensives okay i'm sorry normal tensives normal bp normal bp and they will have metabolic alkalosis and they will have hypercalciuria calcium in urine okay calcium in urine okay whereas gentlemen's they will also have normal bp they'll have metabolic alkalosis and they will have hypomagnesemia rather okay magnesium levels are also low okay the this is very similar to thyroid diuretic effect and little syndrome is basically gain in function of the mineral cortic or rather Uh, gain in function of the enac channels and that is why the patients will end up having uh, hypertension that is a, a secondary hypertension cause of secondary hypertension along with that they will also have metabolic alkalosis okay remember aldosterone loves alkalosis okay so any time that the aldosterone levels are increased or the effects of aldosterone are increased you expect metabolic alkalosis okay so here of course the aldosterone levels will not be increased because it's a gain in function of the receptor aldosterone may levels may be suppressed but the effects of aldosterone are seen and therefore they will have hypertension along with alkalosis and hypokalemia okay so these are also frequently asked questions right okay that's about nephrology i am i'll try and increase my speed now uh again emphasizing this is not the these are not the only points that you need to be studying this is just a prepathon to try and help you figure out where are the areas focus areas from which questions arise have been arising so far so barter's produces renal stones very good dr med has said that's because of the calciuria so hypercalciuria there is going to be renal stones also very good okay so uh, what is the opposite of gentleman syndrome so gentleman syndrome there is a problem with the sodium chloride two chloride right so sodium chloride transporter so what is the opposite when there is a loss of function of this in the distal convoluted tubule it will produce gentleman syndrome what is the manifestation when there is a gain in function of the the channel sodium chloride channel co transporter channel gordon syndrome very good gordon syndrome is a cause of secondary hypertension so gordon syndrome would be the opposite so they will have metabolic acidosis they will have hypertension it's also called as pseudo hypoaldosteronism okay type 2 type 2 pseudo hypoaldosteronism is gordon syndrome where there is opposite effects of what you say in gentleman syndrome okay so and uh, enac so enac gain in function is little syndrome loss in function would be type 1 hypoaldosteronism okay that, that much you can remember you guys are reading well good you're all answering answering well okay moving on to neurology very very important cortical functions every time asked and like you should anticipate that questions will be asked based on them so be a little more thorough about this at least okay so this one particular aspect you please study see abg is a very high yield it's a limited area nothing has changed there is no updates there are no advances okay abg is is a very high scoring area so please do not neglect that ecg it's also high scoring It, it's a little little difficult to understand in the beginning, but with practice you'll get better. So that is also high scoring. They will ask you ABG based questions, and that's why we covered that in our approach. But uh, this is again yet another one. Cortical functions very important. Okay, they will ask you. So try and read up about them. Brainstem stroke syndrome as always evergreen headaches, spinal cord. These are areas where they generally focus. Okay, neurology. So going on with it. Patient is stroke unable to identify objects, but can name. or describe rather their color texture and shape which of the following lobes is likely to be involved so this was a tricky question it was asked in november i nay so there might be a little bit of recall based error because by description if a person is able to identify is not able to name the object but can describe its features including color texture and shape this deficit would be na- would be called as anomia so you know that you know what it is you can't name it but you know what it is what it's for and how its its features are but you can't name it so that is anomia and anomia unfortunately has very poor localizing value and lesions anywhere in the language circuit so it's a very important language 
So it's definitely on the left side. So if, if among these options, something had mentioned left, that would have been great. So the others, if whichever was right, you could have ruled them out. Okay, but unfortunately, if it's anomia, then localizing it to a certain part of the dominant hemisphere is very difficult because it's a very vast language network which tra traverses from frontal to the parietal through the temporal lobe also. So anomia localization is very difficult, but if you had to choose one, if you had to choose one based on what Harrison has mentioned, it could be the temporal lobe. Okay, temporal lobe could be the lesion, dominant temporal lobe, left sided temporal lobe for anomia. Whereas if instead the question had mentioned that the person is not even able to identify its color, texture or shape, not able to describe it at all, not able to describe it at all, then it would be something called visual object agnosia, sorry, visual, visual object agnosia. So which means the patient, the person is not able to even describe it, nor able to name it. Okay. So visual object agnosia, they are not, they're not able to make out what it is. So if they're shown a toothbrush, they may think it's a pen or basically they're not even able to say what it is. Okay. So not even able to identify or describe its features would, would be visual object agnosia. So which means the lesion is an occipital lobe. Okay. It's an occipital lobe lesion. So this is the question from recall base, but more important is what is the pattern? What are they trying to ask? They're trying to ask about cortical functions. Okay. And therefore you should be prepared, well versed with what are the different cortical deficits that can be expected. Yes, very good. Dr. Vishwanath said parietal. Parietal again, if, if it is anomia, parietal again can be correct. Okay. In fact, angular gyrus is angular, angular gyrus lesions in the dominant hemisphere. Okay. Left sided, left angular gyrus lesion. What does it lead to? Angular gyrus lesion leads to something called dash, part of which is finger, agno, finger anomia. I'm sorry, finger anomia. A calculia, dysgraphia, A or A graphia, and right left confusion. What are all these? These four? Right left confusion. When there's a dominant angular gyrus lesion, Justman syndrome, very good. That is a PYQ. It's a previous year's question. So finger anomia. So that's the anomia component is not restricted to one particular place. It's very difficult to localize it. It's a very good indicator that the person has an aphasia, has a cortical problem, but exactly where it's not, it's not a very good localizing feature. So that's why the question, it depends on what the question exactly was. If, if in case the person could not identify even the other features like color, texture and shape and couldn't name it, then it becomes uh, visual object agnosia, which means the lesion is in the occipital. The occipital in the dominant occipital, left side, the dominant occipital lobe lesion will produce visual object agnosia. The non-dominant, the right or the non-dominant occipital lobe lesion will produce something called prosopagnosia. Okay, prosopagnosia. We'll come to that. Okay. Um, right. So, please beware of very, very, very important. And that's why I'll just highlight this. This is from my rapid revision video from the app, the Manipal Medis app. So, please remember the cortical functions. Frontal lobe, very important for executive functions. Okay, to decide what is to be done, what not to be done, those kind of complex decisions are taken in your frontal lobe. So if there's a lesion, so again, frontal lobe can, can be divided, subdivided into obital frontal cortex as well as dorsolateral cortex. When the obital frontal cortex is lost, the, if there's a lesion there, then it leads to disinhibition. So the person behaves inappropriately, whether it's aggression, whether it's hypersexuality, all these inappropriate behaviors come if there is a lesion in the frontal lobe in the obital frontal cortex. It's called disinhibition syndrome. Dorsolateral frontal cortex, if there's a lesion, it leads to abulia, total lock, lack of motivation, total loss of being proactive. So lack of motivation is abulia, abulia syndrome because of dorsolateral frontal lobe. Okay. Primitive reflexes may get activated if there's a frontal lobe lesion. So the person may end up having the re reappearance of glabular tap, the reappearance of palmar grasp, plantar grasp, even sucking and rooting reflexes. All these may reappear. Okay. Palmomental reflex. This is what you see in pediatrics, right? You need to read in pediatrics. Okay, so urinary incontinence, very important. So there's something called paracentral lobule. Okay, paracentral lobule is just beside, if you if you look at the, the cerebral hemispheres. So if you see the coronal view, okay, the cerebral hemispheres, the two hemispheres are like this, right? So the medial aspects, the medial aspects of each of these hemispheres, they are supplied by ACA, the frontal lobe, ACA. Okay, I'm sorry. ACA supplies the 
medial aspect of the frontal lobe which contains this paracentral lobule okay if this is the central sulcus if this is the primary motor cortex it has the motor homunculus no so the medial aspect will have this is the coronal view so i can't exactly show you but i'll show you like this anyway so this is the lower limb like and then the proximal lower limb and then further on there's the trunk and laterally you will have the upper limb and the face and so on okay so in the medial aspect the representation the upper motor neuron representation in the motor cortex precentral gyrus is for the lower limbs right and this paracentral lobule is the gyrus that is situated the, the tissue that is situated in the medial aspect of the frontal lobe around the central sulcus okay so that is why this paracentral lobule is important for lower limb control the upper motor neuron representation also it has of course it has the sensory cortex also primary sensory cortex representing the lower limb but it also has centers for urinary uh, control rather so center for urinary control upper uh, higher centers for urinary control are present in the paracentral lobule so if there's a lesion in the paracentral lobule it can lead to urinary incontinence also this is what you see in patients of nph normal pr pressure hydrocephalus they will have an increased pressure and therefore loss of tissue affecting this area the paracentral lobule that's why they end up developing gait apraxia so gait apraxia is another feature of frontal lobe gait apraxia don't think that apraxia is always parietal lobe gait apraxia is actually it's also called brun's ataxia or gait ataxia now this is something that is seen it's mag magnetic gait that is seen in patients of nph along with urinary features okay so frontal lobe this is what you expect change in personality so frontal temporal dementia what will happen total change in personality it doesn't behave what he was how he used to okay totally opposite of how he was now frontal lobe there's not much of difference between dominant non dominant but temporal and parietal lobe there are differences that which is why you need to know this is where apraxia comes in apraxia this is a pyq it it is a feature of dominant parietal lobe lesion okay so apraxia when you talk when i say apraxia i mean either ideational or idiomotor or idiomotor ideational or idiomotor okay so the thing about idiomotor is idiomotor apraxia the person can put together certain bits of the steps that are to be that are involved okay so for example if the person with dominant parietal lobe lesion is given a toothbrush and asked to brush his teeth he is not able to he is not able to because the person has apraxia even though there is no upper motor or lower motor neuron lesion pyramidal tract is intact extra pyramidal tract is intact cerebellum is intact basal ganglia are intact no sensory abnormalities and he he heard the instruction he understood it also but he is not able to do it because he's been asked to brush with a toothbrush instead if the examiner instructs pick up the toothbrush in your right hand put, apply the toothpaste bring it near your mouth open your mouth then start brushing that means he'll do it okay so step by step if it is described individual small steps he is able to do it he is able to function but if he is asked to integrate all this though he knows how to do it he is not able to do it that is called idiomotor apraxia so the the good thing about idiomotor apraxia is it it doesn't it doesn't uh, disability it doesn't cause disabilities to the patient so the person can still be independent on instruction the person is not able to do but if he really wants to brush his teeth he'll pick up the brush and he'll, he'll do it everything by himself but he's not able to do it on command so that is the problem with idiomotor apraxia ideational apraxia is just the idea itself is just not going to come even even with the smallest of step just take the toothbrush in your hand means he's not able to do it okay so even the yes, the single step cannot be followed is ideational the thought of that the planning of the particular act itself is not there so that is ideational apraxia idiomotor is at least the person can be independent they can do it themselves but on command when they have to add 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 they're not able to do it but if they are asked to do 2 and then 2 and then 2 they are able to do it okay so apraxia dominant parietal lobe lesion this is a pyq the two types of apraxias that are not dominant parietal lobe they are non dominant parietal lobe are constructional apraxia and dressing apraxia okay so potential pyqs if they ask which of the following is not because of a dominant parietal lobe lesion the dressing apraxia and dressing apraxia and constructional apraxia would be the answers otherwise all other buccofacial apraxia limb kinetic apraxia ideational apraxia idiomotor apraxia all these are dominant lobe okay dysphasias may be seen parietal lobe is where the arcuate fasciculus is so conduction aphasias may be seen because of parietal lobe lesions dominant okay dominant is decided by language function where is the language contralateral inferior quadrant tenopia this is common to both dominant and non dominant a calculia and these four we discussed are jasmine syndrome jasmine syndrome dominant angular gyrus lesion which is in the parietal lobe okay non parietal or non dominant lobe 
lesions will lead to spatial disorientation. Okay, this typically affects Alzheimer's disease patients. Okay, they they lose their way. They're not sure where they've come. If they ventured outside the house, they're not sure where they are. They lose track. Okay, so spatial disorientation, constructional apraxia, as I said, constructional apraxia is used as a screening test in detection of hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, contralateral inferior quadrant topia is the same, and contralateral hemineglect. Okay, hemineglect is yet another PYQ. So remember, when there is in terms of attention. the dominant hemisphere the left side hemisphere is only going to control the attention towards the right side of the body whereas the right sided hemisphere the parietal lobe right parietal lobe will have attention towards both sides of the body okay so that means for the left side of the body only the right parietal lobe is having attention whereas for the right side both hemisphere both parietal lobes are having attention if there is a lesion that involves the right parietal lobe the non dominant parietal lobe the left half of the body would be neglected and that is called hemi neglect okay right hemi uh, right sided rather do, non dominant lobe parietal lobe lesion will lead to left hemi neglect okay you don't get a right hemi neglect it's very unusual and uncommon so in ini it's impossible so they'll only ask you typical manifestations okay atypical or very rare manifestations of a if they have to if they have to frame a case scenario they'll frame the more typical manifestations of it they can't give you atypical case scenarios they'll give you a typical case scenario so right hemi neglect almost impossible left left hemi neglect is what you get because of a non dominant parietal lobe lesion okay so what you should also keep in mind is prosopagnosia which i'll tell you again prosopagnosia is the inability to recognize familiar faces so inability to recognize familiar faces is prosopagnosia which occurs due to a non dominant occipital lobe lesion so there again occipital lobe also little bit of difference is there between dominant and non dominant non dominant occipital lobe lesion leads to prosopagnosia inability to recognize familiar faces coming to temporal lobe okay you can get complex hallucinations because of temporal lobe involvement the limbic system involvement memory impairment again seizures mesial temporal sclerosis right so mesial temporal sclerosis there is going to be hippocampal atrophy okay seizures would be there very complicated seizures uh, that means focal seizures with discognitive features okay focal seizures with discognitive features again superior quadrant topia so if it's a temporal lobe it's superior quadrant topia contralaterally and if it's parietal lobe it's inferior quadrant topia wernicke's aphasia because the wernicke's area lies in the superior temporal gyrus left sided superior temporal gyrus okay non dominant temporal lobe that is because of lesions in in this there can be poor non verbal memory loss of music skills complex hallucinations okay one more word a prosody okay what is a prosody a prosody is when there is a lack of emotional intonation when one is speaking okay instead of me saying i how are you so if i say like this it's very monotonous there's no there's no emotion to it so instead i say hi hey, how are you there's an there's an emotion to it so that kind of intonation that comes into speech that is called prosody the prosody is decided by the non dominant hemisphere the motor the fluent speech is coming out because of the dominant hemisphere the emotional intonation within that speech is coming from the non dominant hemisphere so if there is a non dominant hemisphere frontal lobe lesion that corresponds to broca's area so broca's area is in the dominant front the inferior frontal gyrus of the dominant hemisphere whereas if there is a inferior frontal gyrus lesion in the non dominant hemisphere you get a prosody okay potential mcq potential ini question okay so occipital lobe lesions can lead to simultagnosia prosopagnosia optic ataxia oculomotor apraxia so actually the the combination so simultagnosia of course is in the it's it's in the occipital temporal rather it's in the occipital temporal region okay let me not put it as occipital lobe i'll put it as occipital temporal occipital temporal temporal cortex okay so lesions here will can produce these four and a combination of these is known as balance syndrome balance syndrome i'm sorry not temporal parietal apologies parietal occipital parietal so lesion in this region can end up producing balance syndrome balance syndrome is a combination of simultagnosia simultagnosia is where you, know, you cannot get the entire picture for example in the ecg if i showed you the ecg and you you are able to not you are not able to see the pqrs together you are only able to see only one qrs you are not able to see the next qrs if i ask you to calculate rate you need to see the the two qrss together no 
but you're not able to see it you know only able to see only qrs one qrs so that is simultaneous and not able to get the entire picture only a part of the picture you can you you can understand or you can receive okay that is a simultaneousia is when you're not able to picture the entire uh, you're not able to grasp the entire picture simultaneously a simultaneousia prosopagnosia is inability to recognize familiar faces usually it's in the non dominant occipital lobe optic ataxia is when you're not able to judge the distance from if, if you are you are seeing something if i'm seeing my laptop in front of me i'm not able to judge the distance between me and my laptop so that is optic ataxia oculomotor apraxia is i want to move my eyelid or rather eyeball if i want to move my eyes to a particular direction but i'm not able to so that is called optic apra oculomotor apraxia very good himanshu said for missing the forest we missing the forest for a tree so you're shown a forest you see only one tree so that is asymptognosia very good missing a forest for trees okay if you remember if you if you know about the story of uh, just divulging for briefly okay if you know about the story of arjuna so when dronacharya was giving archery training to pandavas so he everyone thought unfairly dronacharya was favoring arjuna but arjuna, he had a point dronacharya had a point because arjuna was clearly superior to all the others so what he did was he kept a wooden bird on a tree tree branch and he asked pandavas one by one to come and take their shot at it on the archery to bow and arrow and when each of the pandavas came he would ask them as they were about to release their arrow he would ask them what do you see what are you seeing they would describe i am seeing the bird i am seeing the tree the branch the sky behind and all that okay all of them none of them were able to tell focused in a focused way when arjuna's turn came what did he say he can see only one thing he can see only the eye of the bird right and when he released his arrow it went straight and hit the bird whereas all the others missed so this is somewhat like asymptognosia of course it's a very good thing for arjuna that he was able to get the target hit the target accurately and that that is a testament to his techniques but asymptognosia is where you're shown everything but you're able to see only one thing okay so that example was only to to sort of highlight what is asymptognosia i'm not saying arjuna had asymptognosia he had his own superior talents okay right so these are important one more area i feel questions will come are from on aphasia aphasia based questions are anyway being asked but what you should try and look at is where, where you can falter okay so you know that broca's aphasia it's it's the fluency is lost so these are the these are the three main things that you need to look for fluency comprehension and repetition to try and make a diagnosis of the speech disorder that the patient has okay so if the fluency is lost it's broca's area okay because the output is coming from broca's area so if the flu the speech is non fluent the broca area is likely to be affected especially when repetition is also lost so in broca's aphasia fluency is lost repetition is lost in wernicke's aphasia comprehension is lost and repetition is lost fluency is maintained so the previous year's question was fluent aphasia is seen in and the answer is wernicke's aphasia fluency is maintained but the output is totally gibberish okay patient with sensory aphasia or wernicke's aphasia the lesion in the dominant superior temporal gyrus they are not able to comprehend what is what they are being told okay they are not make, able to make sense they can hear but they are not able to make sense out of those words and likewise when they are asked to speak they'll end up speaking in a it, it's called neologism so it will be filled with new words meaningless words meaningless sounds so neologisms as well as jargon speech okay so jargon speech and neologisms are what are used by patients with fluent aphasia due to wernicke's lesion wernicke's area lesion okay so loss of comprehension with fluent speech but filled with the meaningless words with loss of repetition is wernicke's aphasia so these are things i think you are all familiar with right so there should be not not much of an issue trying to make out what is broca's aphasia and what is wernicke's aphasia don't don't think too much about reading and writing reading writing is lost in many of these aphasias naming is lost almost universally in everything that is why localizing naming when there is anomia localizing becomes very very difficult it's, it's difficult okay what i feel can be tricky is conduction aphasia now conduction aphasia remember comprehension is intact and uh, uh, speech output is also intact so fluency of speech is intact comprehension is intact repetition is lost so person is able to speak when he wants to person is able to understand what you have said but you ask them to repeat something they are not able to Okay, so if if you are asking them to read out a newspaper, they are not able to. But when they want to read their newspaper by themselves, they are understanding what whatever is being written. So they are able to read well, they are understanding it also. But asked to repeat, they can't. Okay, so 
please remember in conduction aphasia repetition is lost comprehension fluency is maintained isolation aphasia i feel is a tricky one where they can pose a question based on so in isolation aphasia repetition is intact okay they are able to repeat but they are not understanding there is no comprehension and even the speech output the fluency is lost okay so speech output lost i mean fluency is lost and comprehension is lost but repetition is intact so what will this lead to repeating of words so you ask them to repeat something they are repeating it but are you understanding what i am saying no they are not so this is known as eco lalia so they may give you a scenario where a person has developed a stroke and person is only repeating whatever is being told to him but is not understanding the comprehension is lost and the speech is non fluent so what kind of aphasia is it it is isolation aphasia okay so these are pot possible questions based on aphasia okay so please revise aphasia uh, and cortical functions okay and just a word on brain stem stroke syndrome so i'll do this fast i'm sorry not here brain stem stroke syndromes you all know very well about brain stem stroke syndromes so let's take it a little fast if you don't mind the midbrain lesions so what are the midbrain first of all so to begin with if there is a brain stem stroke there is going to be contralateral hemiplegia so there is going to be crossed manifestations basically so crossed manifestations not need not be hemiplegia like in lateral medullary syndrome there is no hemiplegia so crossed manifestations are important if there are crossed manifestations certain manifestations on ipsilateral certain manifestations contralateral then you you localize it to the brain stem now where in the brain stem will be decided by which cranial nerves are involved so in the case of webus or rather in the case of brain, mid brain you have webus syndrome where there is third nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia you have benedict syndrome benedict okay so ben is an addict ben is an addict what addict is a an alcohol addict so because ben is an addict he is drinking alcohol his eyes are becoming red eyes are red okay ben who is an addict drinking alcohol eyes are red and when he stops drinking he develops withdrawal tremors okay remember ben is a korean also so ben from korea he is an alcohol addict he consumed alcohol his eyes became red he stopped drinking he started developing withdrawal tremors okay so this is benedict syndrome Okay, so Benedict syndrome, the lesion is in the red nucleus. Therefore, the eye is lost. Along with that, they have rubral tremors. Okay, so rubral tremors are seen even in and chorea is also seen. So it's a Korean man. Ben is a Korean man. So chorea is another feature of Benedict syndrome. Okay, and that's a midbrain lesion. Third nerve. Th the moment you say so, third and fourth nerves are in the midbrain. Okay, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth are in the pons. Everything below is in the medulla. Okay, so if the third nerve is getting involved, fourth nerve syndromes are very rare, so you don't expect fourth nerve syndromes. Okay, third nerve syndrome is what may be asked, mostly will be asked. So if the patient has contralateral hemiplegia along with third nerve, it's Weber syndrome. If the patient has Benedict syndrome, the lesion in the red nucleus along with the third nerve, so the patient will have ipsilateral third nerve palsy along with tremors and chorea. Okay, and if the patient is having Nothnagel, Nothnagel syndrome, it's a more dorsal syndrome. it will be associated with third nerve and contralateral ataxia contralateral ataxia okay it's a more dorsal midbrain syndrome the most dorsal midbrain syndrome is parinod but even nothnagel is a dorsally the lesion will be situated dorsally clot syndrome is a combination of benedict and nothnagel okay it's a more extensive lesion even the red nucleus is involved superior cerebellar peduncle is also involved okay the ataxia in nothnagel syndrome is because of involvement of the uh, lesion in the superior cerebellar peduncle okay yeah i'm i'm sorry if i'm going a little fast but i'm i'll i'll do my best to try and still make it uh, understandable okay so clot syndrome is a combination of benedict and of uh, nothnagel okay parinod syndrome you can remember parinod syndrome using this mnemonic i know parinod spelling is p a okay so but for the sake of the mnemonic i have kept it as p e so but please remember it's parinod syndrome but parinod syndrome you can remember as the mnemonic perinod p stands for pineal gland tumor usually parinod syndrome doesn't occur because of a stroke it occurs because of pineal gland tumor okay so p is for pineal gland tumor e is for eyelid retraction it's called collier's sign r is reflex dissociation that means the uh, light and accommodation reflexes they dissociate it's it resembles an agile robert robertson pupil so accommodation reflex is present but no pupillary reflex or no light reflex infraduction that means sunset signs so the person will keep looking down that's i n is nystagmus what kind of nystagmus can you guys answer in the chat box 
what kind of nystagmus do you see in perinode syndrome abduction so it's not a ab true abduction palsy because of the increased convergence it it seems as though there is abduction palsy that's why it's called pseudo abduction and upgaze palsy is uh, again as a result of uh, infraduction so the person remains looking down collier sign so they're not able to see look up and dorsal it's a dorsal midbrain syndrome so d is for dorsal dorsal midbrain syndrome okay so remember whenever something involves the vertical gaze vertical gaze means the problem lies with the midbrain midbrain problems will give rise to vertical gaze problems okay when the problem is in the horizontal gaze the problem lies in the pons okay so pons is when it's a horizontal gaze problem okay so nystagmus anybody i'll wait for that answer right so that's about the midbrain syndromes what about pontine syndromes we have a few pontine syndromes these include okay i have not mentioned okay i have mentioned here so the raymond syndrome is just a, a six nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia and remember in uh, millard gubler everybody knows this mnemonic millard gubler right so millard has seven letters gubler has six letters so that's why the lesion in millard gubler is sixth and seventh nerve palsy so in sixth and seventh nerve palsy the problem here is the lesion lies in the fascicle of the sixth nerve so therefore uh, the person will have problems with abduction towards the same side so if the patient has a right sided miller gubler their abduction to the right side is impaired but the gaze is still is still intact so the opposite eye the medial rectus can still contract so they don't have a gaze palsy they only have a an abduct ipsilateral abduction palsy whereas if the patient has a fovel syndrome the lesion lies at the level of the sixth nerve nucleus so sixth nerve nucleus lesion will lead to total gaze palsy neither will the ipsilateral lateral rectus contract nor will the the contralateral medial rectus okay so total gaze palsy ipsilateral gaze palsy will be there if there is a fovel syndrome because of a sixth nerve nucleus lesion along with a seventh nerve lesion okay seventh nerve remember wraps around the sixth nerve to produce a facial colliculus right and uh, sometimes you can get a lateral pontine syndrome also it's called mary fox syndrome so in mary fox syndrome there will be hornus so remember when there is eyelid drooping no if a patient has a brain stem stroke and has developed eyelid drooping it could be because of weber syndrome because the third nerve is gone because third nerve is also important for uh, third nerve lesion also produces stosis or it could be because of hornus syndrome hornus syndrome can occur in lateral medullary syndrome which is uh, which everybody knows but it can also occur in lateral pontine syndromes lateral pontine syndrome occurs due to occlusion of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery leads to mary fox syndrome okay or lateral pontine syndrome where they'll have seventh nerve palsy also eighth nerve palsy also but along with that they'll also have hornus syndrome ipsilaterally okay nobody answered for the nystagmus it's convergence nit retraction nystagmus okay convergence retraction nystagmus that's what that's the kind of nystagmus you see in patients of perinode sy syndrome okay and finally coming to medullary syndromes medial medullary everybody knows there will be ipsilateral 12th nerve hypoglossal nerve palsy so when you ask them to protrude the tongue if there's a right sided hypoglossal nerve palsy the tongue will also deviate to the right okay so tongue deviates to the same side of the lesion so along with that contralateral hemiplegia medial medullary syndrome there is going to be hemiplegia lateral medullary syndrome no hemiplegia instead they'll have all the other cranial nerves getting involved starting from the fifth cranial nerve so there is the crossed hemi the crossed manifestations in lateral medullary syndrome is there is loss of pain and temperature from ipsilateral face with loss of pain and temperature from contralateral body okay that is the crossed manifestation in in patients of lateral medullary syndrome please keep that in mind along with that they'll also have hornus syndrome they'll have loss of taste there'll be a lesion in the nucleus tractus solitarius there'll be a lesion in the nucleus ambiguous okay rarely seventh nerve may also get involved but otherwise it's fifth inferior vestibular nucleus will there'll be a lesion so fifth eighth sometimes seventh fifth eighth and along, along with that ninth and tenth and it will spare the twelfth of course okay so remember fifth nerve it's the spinal nucleus so it it comes quite quite far below the level of the I, i i remember i told you fifth nerve is pons but the spinal nucleus of fifth nerve it has four nuclei trigeminal nerve has four nuclei the fifth nerve spinal nucleus comes down all the way to cervical uh, spinal cord also up to c2 c3 also it can come down so that is why when there's a lesion in the lateral aspect of the medulla you can have a fifth nerve manifestation okay right so these are the brain stem syndromes just revising briefly okay remember the arteries also the artery occlusion for posterior inferior cerebellar artery syndrome is not pica 
it's actually vertebral artery and in case of uh, again medial medullary syndrome also the the artery involved are the branches of vertebral artery okay and uh, basilar artery occlusion is for pontine okay and posterior cerebral cerebral arteries for the midbrain syndromes okay sorry midbrain syndromes midbrain syndrome is the posterior cerebral arteries okay right so that is about brain stem syndromes the management aspect you all know what are the indications for thrombolysis what are the contraindications please make sure the blood pressure is less than 185 by 110 that is the cut off for if you want to plan for thrombolysis the indication for thrombolysis is the patient should have had symptom onset less than 4.5 hours ago and the patient should not have cerebral edema exceeding 1/3 of the cerebral hemisphere okay on a ct scan initial ct scan you do so when the patient arrived you put the patient subject the patient to a plain ct you knew that the deficits are there and therefore you did a plain ct that showed edema which was less than 1/3 of a hemisphere and patient had come within 4.5 hours of the onset of symptoms therefore the patient can go and undergo thrombolysis or fibrinolysis and even after that you can subject them to a ct angiography you did a, you did a plain ct patient was in the window period you thrombolysed along with that do a ct angiography in the ct angiography if you see that there is an occlusion of a large vessel like for example occlusion of the internal carotid artery main internal carotid artery or the basilar basilar artery or or, or a vertebral artery along with middle cerebral artery so the proximal middle cerebral artery internal carotid artery basilar artery if these are occluded then you can subject them for mechanical thrombectomy okay so mechanical thrombectomy within 24 hours you can still do the thrombolysis is 4.5 hours mechanical thrombectomy thrombectomy is 24 hours so if a patient arrives uh, outside of the window period you can still directly offer them mechanical thrombectomy okay so moving on i hope you guys are all with me i have not heard back from you guys since that nystagmus question so based on the brain stem stroke syndromes the patient has loss of pain in temperature from right half of the face and left half of the body so there is the there is your crossed manifestation there is no mention of hemiplegia patient also has drooping of eyelid myosis and loss of sweating probably on the ipsilateral side of the face on a syndrome where is the side of the lesion since it's right side okay right side loss of pain and temperature that means the lesion must be in the right side of the medulla okay so right we still have headaches okay so this is a slide to try and summarize headaches remember primary headaches are very frequently asked it's not coming fully is it okay primary headaches are very frequently asked Tre treatment aspects of primary headaches are very important so remember cluster headache treatment acutely is through the nose whether it is nasal sumatriptan or if it is inhaled oxygen or even the the treatment can be with zolmitriptan nasal zolmitriptan also so or subcutaneous uh, sumatriptan or through oxygen and oxygen flow rate should be at least 10 liters per minute 10 to 15 liters per minute that is a pyq okay so 10 to 15 liters of oxygen per minute this is for acute treatment prophylaxis you can use steroids also prednisolone can be given or you can use anti migraine drugs like verapamil like topiramate even galcanizumab so galcanizumab is another option for treatment of cluster headaches so these are trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias which i am summarizing okay treatment for paroxysmal hemicrenia is indomethacin ex exquisitely responsive to indomethacin and for short lasting unilateral neuralgia form headache with autonomic dysfunction or conjunctival suffusion and injection and tearing that means suna and sunct the treatment for these would be lamotrigine lamotrigine works very well so you can use duration of treatment to try and make arrive at the diagnosis usually the cluster headaches episodes of course there'll be periodicity it'll be more common in men it'll be more common among alcohol alcohol be a trigger but the duration of attack will be in hours whereas in paroxysmal hemicrenia the duration of attack will be in minutes so 20 to 30 minutes of headache per day unilateral periorbital headache and lasting for 20 30 minutes that is paroxysmal hemicrenia give them endomethacin it settles so now in sunct very frequent attacks very short lasting attacks lasting only for a few minutes sometimes seconds to sometimes minutes and but multiple times in a day lamotrigine works very well okay so these are certain important aspects of headache regarding headache okay so apart from that also migraine related aspects migraine related questions are very common so please revise about migraine treatment okay including gipants the new gipants and ditans all these are important aspects which need to be revised 
before your I and I exams. Okay, so I'm leaving that to you. Dementia, very important. Dementia, we'll quickly revise in this table the different dementias. Alzheimer's disease, the characteristic early manifestation is episodic mem memory loss. Okay, additional features none. Alzheimer's disease is mainly linked to only the brain. Although there is uh, there, there there is a little bit of speculation that type three A diabetes is what is linked to Alzheimer's disease, but that is not universally accepted. Okay, type three A diabetes. You know type three C diabetes is pancreas, right? The type three A diabetes is said to be because of Alzheimer's, but it's not universally accepted. Nonetheless, histologically you see in intracellular or intraneuronal neurofibrillary tangles and extra neuronal amyloid plaques. And these amyloid plaques are A, beta, 42, right? And herona bodies are additional histological findings. Radiologically, you'll see medial temporal lobe atrophy, entorhinal cortex being affected first. Okay, and genetics wise, what is important is trisomy 21, presenalin 1 and presenalin 2 on their respective genes, chromosome number 14, chromosome number 1. And the trisomy 21 is associated with an increase in levels of the um, the the protein APS. Okay, so and that is why they can end up developing early Alzheimer's. Trisomy 21 Down syndrome patients can develop early Alzheimer's. Apo E4 has a, an increased risk for uh, random or ra rather uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so Apo E4 mutations on chromosome 19 can lead to sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Treatment: memantin, rivastigmine, donepezil, galcanizumab. Uh, rather so galantamine but remember the monoclonal antibodies which are used in alzheimer's disease can anybody name the monoclonal antibodies approved for treatment of alzheimer's disease okay likewise frontotemporal dementia remember there'll be executive function loss that means they'll behave very awkwardly inappropriate behavior will be the feature in frontotemporal dementia Association with motor neuron disease, especially ALS. So, ALS is associated with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. Remember, frontotemporal dementia can be behavioral variant or aphasic variant. The temporal lobe getting atrophied more is aphasic variant. Frontal lobe getting uh, atrophied more is behavioral variant. Okay. So, any answers for the monoclonal antibody associated or used for treatment of, used in treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So, right. So, histologically, in frontotemporal dementia, you may see pig bodies. These are again intraneural, intraneuronal inclusion bodies called lecanim lecanimab. Okay. Yes. Very good. So, very good. So, lecanimab is the monoclonal antibody most recently approved for use in Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And uh, apart from that, you can. There's another, any other antibodies you can use, monoclonal antibodies? Okay, the answer is aducanumab. Okay, aducanumab is the other antibody. Okay, coil bodies, you can also see inclusions or that, that are rich in tau, tau protein and FUS that is fused in sarcoma and TDP43. TDP43, aducanumab, very good. Imanshu, absolutely correct. And tau, these account for the most common, most uh, most of the cases of frontotemporal dementia. So, not much in radiology, it's frontal and temporal atrophy. Remember the genes C9, ORF72, as well as MA, MAPT. Okay, these are the genes respon uh, responsible, mutations responsible for frontotemporal dementia. Treatment, there is no, no specific treatment for frontotemporal dementias or any of the other dementias for that matter. Okay, PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. Remember, I told you midbrain when there's a lesion, there's a vertical gaze issue. So, like in paranoid syndrome where there is sustain, there is a, an upgrade, upgaze palsy and the sustained down gaze. Likewise, in progressive supranuclear palsy also there is midbrain atrophy, but there is sustained upgaze and there is there is a down gaze palsy. Okay, so down gaze palsy with with frequent postural uh, instability leading to drops or falls rather. So frequent falls with an upgaze palsy. This is what is seen, or rather in down gaze palsy. This is what is seen in patients of progressive supranuclear palsy. Okay. So down gaze palsy and this is again a tauopathy hummingbird sign so hummingbird sign in mri is because in the sagittal section the midbrain has atrophied that's why it appears as if it's a hummingbird it looks like a hummingbird that is on sagittal section on uh, uh, the cross sections you can see morning glory it appears as if morning glory or mickey mouse sign that's what they describe as because of the atrophy of the midbrain again no specific treatment okay electrooculogram finding of psp is square wave jerks these are additional points. 
okay and uh, lewy body dementia the it's a subcortical dementia lewy body dementia is a syn alpha syn nucleopathy and it's characterized by parkinson like features so is psp psp also has parkinson like features but there's a lot of postural instability in both postural instability is both but autonomic dysfunction is much more in patients of lewy body dementia and uh, rem sleep behavioral disorder this is again another very important feature along with parkinson's in patients of lewy body dementia so lewy bodies are what you see in patients of lewy body dementia on histology okay prion disease rapidly progressive young age of onset very aggressive course characterized by dementia along with myoclonus and on eeg you will see something known as poly spike with wave okay poly spike and wave so sspe you know that sspe is SSP is a post measles or rather it's a chronic measles infection right so subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis so it's a it's a complication of chronic measles infection so likewise you can remember the eeg finding there are poly spikes and slow waves periodically to periodic emissions okay so spike and slow wave periodic emissions this is what you see both in ssp and in prior and disease okay myoclonus is what you get clinically spongiform degeneration on histology or rather on uh, on gross examination okay right so this is about dementia i'll finish up the the neurology part in a few more slides and uh, and we'll continue the remaining chapters in another part subsequently okay so uh, i don't want to overburden you guys also so quickly we'll wrap up what was left in neurology a few slides and then we'll wrap up today's session right so spinal cord disorders this is also very important from your ini point of view so in in spinal cord disorders can you guess these i hope you're able to see the contrast okay so i'll read it out also if there's a lesion affecting the anterior horn cell in the spinal cord if there's a lesion affecting the anterior horn cell the corticospinal tract but it's it's sparing the dorsal column lateral spinothalamic tract and urinary bladder function what would the diagnosis be so remember if both lmn and uml lesions are there and everything else is spared you have to think of mainly a, a disorder that's affecting only the motor neurons which means it's a motor neuron disease right so a motor neuron disease that's affecting the spinal cord it could be a a, a part of als or it could be a primary lateral sclerosis also so generally primary lateral sclerosis affects the lmn also so more likely to be als so when there is L combined lmn and umn you think of als okay especially when there is a umn manifestation in the upper limb and an lmn manifestation in the lower limb then the diagnosis almost always is als amyotrophic lateral sclerosis very good dr vishwanath thanks for staying with me okay so thanks imanshu very good correct correct so that is the first one so number 1 is als next if there is a lesion that's affecting the corticospinal tract sparing the anterior horn cell along with that the dorsal column is lost so the myelinated tracts are lost if the myelinated tracts are lost and it spared the anterior horn cell it spared the lateral spinothalamic tract and the urinary bladder so that means it's a lesion that's affecting the myelinated fibers which is probably you guys can try and guess okay next lesion if there's a lesion that spared the anterior horn cell affected the corticospinal tract spared the posterior column affected the lateral spinothalamic tract okay and urinary bladder is also lost or urinary bladder function is also lost okay uh, i'll have to apologize for a correction here the anterior horn cell also will be in lost okay in this anterior horn cell will also be lost so you what pattern you can make out is all the anterior structures are lost and the posterior structure is spared dorsal column is spared anterior structures lost posterior structures spared so what is the difference between the anterior structures and the posterior structures in the spinal cord mainly blood supply mainly blood supply okay the anterior spinal artery supplies the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord to the single anterior spinal artery the two posterior spinal arteries supply the posterior one third of the spinal cord that's why if there's a an occlusion it will affect the anterior 
two thirds of the spinal cord mainly because it's a single ASA that is reinforced at every level by intercostal arteries. But uh, there is, of course, the artery of Adam Kivix. If that is occluded, that means it is going to lead to a watershed infarct in the spinal cord, the anterior aspect of the spinal cord, leading to this kind of manifestation, where the only thing that is spared is the structure that is supplied by the posterior spinal arteries, and that is anterior spinal artery infarct. Okay. So if the anterior horn cell is also lost and all the structures are lost, all the structures in the spinal cord are uniformly lost. Okay, bladder is lost. Usually the bladder will be the first to be lost in this particular. So the person is not able to pass uh, void urine. There is bladder distension. There is urinary retention. Along with that, the person develops paraparesis. Person cannot feel anything. Person develops a level of uh, sensory loss beyond above which the person can't perceive any sensations. So this is something that is typical in transverse myelitis. So this would be transverse myelitis. Okay. Transverse myelitis, acute transverse myelitis, it's a total section. So, in patients, so the common doubt that arises is between uh, transverse myelitis due to NMO and transverse myelitis due to multiple sclerosis. The difference is in NMO, it will be uh, transverse myelitis that affects more than three or more segments of the spinal cord in continuity. So, transverse myelitis that is longitudinally extensive, longitudinally extensive spinal uh, transverse myelitis is a feature of NMO whereas in multiple sclerosis it will be patchy okay, it will not affect the it will neither affect continuous uh, length of spinal cord several segments in continuity nor will it be completely transverse okay it may spare a few tracts of course it affects mainly the myelinated tracts but it may still spare a few tracts even in a particular cross section so that is transverse myelitis where everything is supposed to be lost okay what if there is a spinal cord lesion where the anterior horn cells and the, the, the corticospinal tract is intact, dorsal column is lost, bladder is lost, but lateral spinothalamic tract is intact. This is what you get in Tabes dorsalis, Tabes dorsalis, that is tertiary syphilis, neurosyphilis, Tabes dorsalis. As the name suggests, dorsalis, dorsal column is the only thing that is lost along with bladder sensations. The person will have uh, uh, a rather neurogenic bladder. Okay, and then what if only the corticospinal tract is lost but all the other tracts are intact in the spinal cord this is primary lateral sclerosis this is also a motor neuron disease als is also motor neuron disease amyotrophic lateral sclerosis amyotrophy that means there is muscle wasting amyotrophic lateral sclerosis this is a type of motor neuron disease which has both MA, uh, upper and low motor neuron manifestations whereas primary lateral sclerosis lateral because it's the lateral column in the spinal cord it is the lat uh, rather it's the corticospinal tract if you if you look at the in the spinal cord the corticospinal tracts are laterally located so amyotrophic lateral sclerosis that is amyotrophy plus lateral sclerosis primary lateral sclerosis is only sclerosis of the corticospinal tract within the spinal cord that is another type of mnd okay and finally if there is anterior horn cell that is lost along with loss of lateral spinothalamic tract and urinary bladder but sparing of the dorsal column so this is called dissociative anesthesia where there is sparing of the posterior column sensations but loss of cortic lateral spinothalamic tract. Th this is what is seen in syringomyelia. So syringomyelia or an intramedullary compressive lesion can produce this kind of a picture where there is dissociative sensory loss. Okay, so this was just a, to try and make it a little unique regarding how to study for spinal cord. Otherwise, please remember spinal cord disorders. Syringomyelia is very important. It's been asked. Dissociative sensory loss, suspended anesthesia. That is also important. It's like cape-like distribution. Okay, so only a certain segment, a certain few of the dermatomes, there will be loss of pain and temperature. But they will still have intact fine touch. They'll have intact proprioception. Okay, and along with that, they'll have atrophy because element type of lesion. And they'll have bladder, okay, bladder involvement because the bladder fibers pass very close to the central canal. And if there is a... Uh, syringomyelia it will affect the surrounding fibers the fiber surrounding the central canal first so that's why bladder involvement is quite early in syringomyelia okay otherwise uh, one thing that we did not say was this kind of a posterolateral so this kind of a posterolateral syndrome is what you get myelin right so this is what you get in patients of b12 deficiencies
subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord vitamin b12 deficiency you can get this kind of loss of posterior column as well as the corticospinal tract myelinated fibers differentials for this would be copper deficiency vitamin e deficiency you can also see this a similar picture in hiv vaculopathy so hiv could also produce vaculopathy resembling this okay so this is about spinal cord disorders a few aspects regarding it so remember if there is anterior spinal artery infarct the patient will complain of sudden onset back pain along with acute paraparesis and this paraparesis will spare the posterior columns okay sparing the posterior columns right and uh, this should be it okay for discussing of spinal cord okay one question that was asked in last ini was i'm sorry yeah last ini was regarding if a patient with alzheimer's disease does not have is not able to or not willing to take oral medications what are the alternatives for him reverse stigmine can be given as a transdermal patch and therefore that is the answer so if similar question applies for parkinson's disease remember rotigotin and apomorphin along with newer preparations of levodopa are also available parenterally the okay, parental preparations are available but otherwise for alzheimer's disease among these options reverse stigmine is the one which can be given transdermally this was a question that was asked okay so i will wrap up in just a couple of slides this can you can you identify those guys who are who are live can you identify what are the what is the deficit here the an uh, aged brain is not the husband aged husband is not able to identify the aged wife so he's asking tum kaun ho and a familiar face when it's not getting recognized what is it next the person the aged brain himself cannot identify the husband himself cannot identify himself we can't remember he's asking mai kaun hu so that is, that means the person has a sort of memory loss and finally if the wife is stunned at how the husband is behaving total behavior change what is it okay so inability to recognize familiar faces is prosopagnosia can occur in strokes especially in the non dominant occipital lobe okay episodic memory loss is what characterizes alzheimer's disease where they are very forgetful and memory loss is a prominent feature memory loss is not a very prominent feature of frontotemporal dementia instead it occurs uh, rather the memory loss uh, is a feature of alzheimer's disease especially episodic whereas behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia is where the behaviors change and that's because it affects the frontal lobe either the orbito frontal cortex or the dorsolateral frontal lobe okay so this is about pics disease which is frontotemporal dementia frontotemporal dementia was earlier known as pics disease now they're not synonymous the better answer is frontotemporal dementia okay just something to help you remember okay primary progressive ms this was a question uh, two or three years ago i think and uh, the question was primary progressive ms what is the drug of choice it still remains or say ocrelizumab Okay, so ocrelizumab is a drug of choice for primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Okay, multiple sclerosis. All the others can still be given, and glatiramer acetate is the safest anti-multiple sclerosis drug. But in terms of primary progressive MS, choose ocrelizumab. Primary progressive MS tends to affect the spinal cord more often. Okay, I think what we'll do is with this we'll close today's session on general medicine prepathon. It turned out to be quite long.